Um, good evening, everybody. Welcome to the March 8th, 2022 meeting of the Hatfield Select Board. Um, I'll call the meeting to order. And as usual, um, we have some time. Well, actually, let me start with uh, reading our public participation policy. The Hatfield Select Board welcomes everyone to its meetings and all other public meetings of the town of Hatfield. All regular and special meetings of the boards and committees of the town of Hatfield shall be open to the public and shall conform to the open meeting law. Executive sessions are closed to the public and will be held only as prescribed by the statutes of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. It is important to recognize that the open meeting law affords the opportunity to listen to the proceedings but not necessarily participate. During meetings of the select board, an attempt will be made to find a balance between hearing from members of the community and conducting the required business of the Hatfield Select Board. Um, as usual, our first item tonight is public forum. It, there's no one here in the room for public forum. Is anyone joining us? I see, I think it's Mike online. Mike, if you have anything for public forum, otherwise I'll, okay, so it doesn't seem like he does. Um, in terms of announcements tonight, I, oh, okay. Um, I don't really have anything except maybe to extend a congratulations to the, the Hatfield sports teams um, that went on to tournament hockey team. I think one Western Mass. We have one, one, one member of the of the Smith Academy um, student body that plays <clears throat> for Greenfield, and then basketball teams went on to some tournament games, and we congratulate them on that. Oh, I just want to say, spring ahead this weekend. It's a good time to check your smoke detectors. That's all. <laughs> Excellent point, Ed. Excellent point. Seems like we just turned the clocks back. Mm -hmm. That came up kind of fast. Um, anything, Nothing Mr. Moriarty? Nothing for me, Madam Chair. Thank you. Okay. Great. Um, so I'll move right on to the um, approval of the minutes. I'll make a motion to approve the minutes from February 15th, 2022. Second. A motion. Pardon me. I have the 15th. I have the 15th. I have March 4th and February 15th. I have March 4th, too. March 4th, I, I was, was just not wondering if they maybe present. all stapled together, but it doesn't look like it. Okay, next time. Can we just do these then tonight? Yeah. So we'll do the February 15th ones first. Did you say you made a motion to accept those? I did those? make a motion for February 15th, yes. Okay. And I did second that. Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, motion made and second. Any further discussion? No. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you, Karen. And then what, the March 4th meeting minutes? I'm not sure I... Oh. I don't have that. Oh, you don't? Were they in this special, in this extra pile of things, right? They're in the extra pile. You have the, in the amended agenda right there. Well, and I, I haven't... Yeah, I wasn't read. at this meeting, so... Yeah. Yeah, we okay holding this off okay. till next week, Marlene? Just yes, so oh, we yeah, can review sure, them. sure, yeah. Okay. So just the February 15th is Yes. Yep. So put those in the next packet, yeah. Right, please. Yep. Okay. okay, so our uh, first, or we do have a very full agenda, so I'm going to try to move this along really quickly tonight. Um, topic one is the COVID update. And I believe that Mr. Osley was going to be joining us for that, correct? Remote. Well, he's not on yet. Um, maybe he didn't expect it to be quite so early. So once he shows up, we'll revisit topic one. Okay. How's that? So Marlene, we'll go right on to uh, your uh, town administrator report. All right. Uh, I'm just asking the board to um, designate the animal control officer's uh, role as uh, to Scott Pomeroy. Scott continues to serve in, in this capacity and this will be submitted to the department Massachusetts Department of Agriculture. We are very grateful to Mr. Pomeroy for the great job he does. Yes we are and I, I did notice that we corrected his original date of hire from 1905. <laughs> yeah. Although he probably thinks it feels like it probably feels, feels like about that long. Years, yeah. uh, to 1998. Yeah. Um, I will make a motion to designate Animal Control Officer uh, Scott Pomeroy to the Mass Department of Agricultural Resource designation. 
I'll, I'll second that, and I, I want to say thank you to Scott for all that he does for the town of Hatfield. Mm -hmm. Agreed. So a motion made and second. Any further discussion? No. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Marlene, I'm just going to sign this. The rest can be filled out by you guys, sure. right? Okay. Yes, absolutely. Okay. Very and I'll be good. glad to um, speak about uh, the two items under continued old business. Okay, great. All right. So the board had uh, previously received a draft of the host community agreement from Pharmacy LLC, and uh, town council reviewed it and reviewed a couple of questions I have. Um, you do have a response in your packet from Attorney Mullen, and I received confirmation from Pharmacy LLC. Um, so the last meeting you had, they had given an address of 139 North Hatfield Road. They have updated that, and you'll see that it's referenced as 140A North Hatfield Road. So and then that would, that's on a different side of the road then. Oh, is it? Oh, well, 139 and 140 wouldn't be on the same no, side. No, I think, um, if I'm not mistaken, the building inspector had realized, so it is the same side. He had noticed, though, yeah, it okay. should be 140, not 139. Okay. So, okay. Um, and and the, they were minimal uh, recommendations, and Pharmacy LLC has, has agreed to those those terms, those changes. And these are incorporated in this new one that was they given are. to us tonight. Mm -hmm. okay. So I thought we had voted it last time unless there was significant the, changes. The agreement so, that had been presented. So we should just re-vote this one? Yes. yes. Okay. I'll make a motion to approve the updated host community agreement for the siting of recreational cultivation marijuana establishment in the town of Hatfield for Hatfield Pharmacy, Inc. Second. A motion made and second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you, Marlene. Thank you. <clears throat> and the next item we have is a requesting the board just, vote sorry. to adopt the Hatfield Hazard actually it should be natural hazard mitigation 21 update um, this is a required local adoption that needs to be submitted to the state once the select board has voted to adopt it then the the state will will submit a, an official notification to the town that it has been approved we have been notified in writing that it is approved pending the local adoption okay. so I would ask the board to, to vote that and, and it just that was there, were, there was an insert in your packet just a, a sort of an outline the tool that the state uses in reviewing right. the hazard mitigation plan yep. well I know uh, you in particular and my colleagues and a lot of other townspeople and residents mm -hmm. put a lot of work and effort into this so we this was thank, the series thank, of meetings yeah. we did hours thank, of, thank, thank you to meetings. all of you they were good meetings yeah. very the time chief, the fire chief yep. Garrett Berry for highway yep. department contributed quite a bit of Stephanie Slish attended a lot of the meetings yep. for planning uh, not board, the right? hazard that was the municipal vulnerability preparedness oh plan, yeah maybe, but my goodness definitely yeah <laughs> they all a little bit of it together. together they do yeah okay they do, they do. i yeah you're right okay so for that a lot of people in town were able to put input into this the people we had we had a whole bunch of people that uh yeah. added input to this report so I, I do agree with my colleagues that you know we want to thank everybody that participated mm. so do we have to vote to accept this vote to adopt the vote to adopt the, this the, the, as presented so we had a meeting about a month a few maybe almost ago, two anyways. months ago right yeah. And we presented the final, yep, uh, version. right. Mm -hmm. And there were some changes. We had to um, add mm -hmm. uh, some additional information. Um, and I believe you received a copy of that too. If we not, did. I can. Okay. Mm -hmm. And um, so, even with those changes that were, or the additional information, they had two questions about things. Um, the fire chief and I were able to answer those questions, and the state was satisfied with. Okay. that additional information okay. so you know the the plan that was presented 
with the addition of two pieces of information. Okay. So we vote that tonight. So I would take vote a to motion. Adopt. So adopt I, I, will, I have no problem making a motion, but I think you changed the wording of what you wanted us to say, did you not? In the so I'll make a motion to approve oh. the... You had said something. Did you add a word when we were talking? I about said the, the Hatfields Natural Hazard Hazard Mitigation 2021 update. Okay, that. That. <laughs> That's my motion. A second. We're, oh, I have the wrong one over here. A motion made and second. Any further discussion? No. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Marlene, thank you for. Yeah, thank you. Marlene. Oh, you're welcome. And the other you. department heads that yep. uh, worked <laughs> hard on that as well. So I did notice that. Um, Mr. Osley is joining us. Hi, Bob. Your microphone is not on. Is not on, Bob. There. Oh, oops. You had it. There you go. <laughs> so we 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 skipped over you briefly, but we'll backtrack now that you're here. So thanks for coming. Pretty, pretty heavy, so I'll just do a quick uh, COVID update. Mm -hmm. um, overall, the numbers are continuing to look good. Um, the numbers from February 22nd through 28th, which was the week that the school, or the kids were <coughs> on school break, uh, we only had two cases. Uh, the previous week we had six. Um, and again, these two cases, as before, are only the ones that are re reported on the MAVEN system. Uh, doesn't include any of the home testing. Um, so uh, tomorrow we are going to be receiving a new set of uh, numbers. And it will be interesting to see that will encompass the week after kids had returned from, uh, from break. I'm um, hoping they stay down. Uh, it's great to see such low numbers, and it allows us more flexibility to kind of move forward on this. Um, just up. as a reminder uh, for those uh, folks that didn't uh, know, as of March 1st, uh, Hatfield no longer has an indoor mask mandate in public places, uh, but I would like to remind people that if at any point they feel uncomfortable going into a store or being in a situation, they can always put the mask on. Uh, of course. But it is optional, not required. Anybody that's at higher risk, not completely vaccinated, can wear a mask. Uh, also, as you probably know, uh, the DPH and DESE, uh, Department of um, uh, elementary and secondary education in February voted to rescind its mask mandate as of February 28th, leaving that masking decision up to the individual school districts and local boards. Um, last week, the CDC came out uh, with a uh, recommendation that where they're re removing uh, the requirement or recommendation that all kids wear masks while they're riding on school buses. Um, so we're seeing, you know, at both state and federal levels kind of peeling back on some of the requirements. Um, but I, I do want to emphasize just with the adults well, what that, that any parents feel uncomfortable with their kids in any situation where masks have been sort of scaled back I would recommend that whatever their comfort level is, have the kids wear the mask. That's what I'm aware of. Even if uh, you know there aren't any masking requirements, so that's all an individual basis as of now. Um, Excuse me, yeah, Bob. I mean, there, that's that's. Are, are not... the schools? Aren't the schools? Did that change? Because weren't wasn't there a mask mandate for the schools until March 12th? Did that? Correct. Yeah, and I was just going to mention oh, that. Okay, sorry, uh, didn't mean to steal your thunder. <laughs> Board of Health uh, voted to extend the school mask mandate until uh, March 12th, as you mentioned, Brian. Um, and uh, the, the reasoning behind that was to see what the trend is, particularly after 
the kids have had a good solid week back in school, see if that has any effect. Again, I'm hoping it doesn't. Um, but we should see some of those numbers uh, tomorrow. Uh, again, the way the um, uh, motion was passed uh, was that the extension will expire on uh -oh. Oh, well, unless we just suddenly we lost you a little bit, Bob. Like your mic got covered by something mm. or something. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, there you are. Uh, yeah. Is that any better? Yes. Much better. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, at this point, uh, or certainly after March 12th, any masking decisions would be up to the individual school districts. Uh, and, and certainly the Board of Health still at any point has the ability to monitor the numbers and if the numbers go up, make any recommendations. No, so we're we're not having an actual any mandates ourselves through the Board of Health. It is now in the hands of each individual school district in the state. So that's where we are. And and again, the numbers will be coming out tomorrow. Um, and I'm just hoping those numbers stay down. Uh, it's encouraging, and you know we're seeing it not only here locally, but statewide and, and nationally. So yeah, it's it's good positive, yeah, for sure. positive things. Yeah, thank you, Bob. Did you have any questions, Ed? Or? So at times the Board of Health has made the decision about the schools. At times the school committee has made the decision about schools. Yeah. At this point it would be, you, you, you have made the decision that as of the 12th, after the 12th, the, it, it would be, it would be the in the hands school of the district school to, uh, you know, through their policy committee, uh, consider the options, consider the, uh, the numbers, situation, and make that decision. And I believe that they, the school committee made a decision to follow DESE guidelines. Correct, yes. Which would mean their, the, the mask mandate would expire yep. at the schools, but people would have the ability to choose to wear them if that's what they're most comfortable with their children doing. Okay, yes. So. Okay, but that's for the school committee, I guess, to... Mm -hmm. Okay, no, I, I don't have any more questions. Do you have no, any? No, th thank you, Bob. Thanks for being here tonight. You're welcome. All right. Thank you. Okay, okay so... Uh, we're a few minutes ahead of schedule. Do you want to go ahead, Mr. Prickett, or do you want us to wait till 6 p.m.? Was the Finance Committee going to be here for that? Oh, the Finance Committee six. is coming in for that. Mm -hmm. So you get to stay and listen to more of this excitement. Can we Maybe get through the Roselle Clark? He's meeting with the Finance Committee and Select Board as well at 6. Oh, Tony's actually going to be here for that? He's going to join remotely. Oh, okay. We don't have anything else we can take up in the no. meantime, right? We got everything done? Um. Is there anything else afterwards here? No, everything else would yeah. involve. Oh boy, the, okay. So no, we could take a break. John, we're, gonna, yeah. we're gonna take a break. Good. So we are back after a brief break um, and we're gonna go a little bit out of order again tonight. We're joined by our auditor, Tony Roselli. Hello, Mr. Roselli. Hello, how are, how's everyone? We're Good, doing Tony. great, how are, how you? are you? Thanks for having me. Sure. So um, you are here tonight to give the audit report of FY21 financials. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> let, me, uh, let me just find my notes here. Your, your cover letter regarding the financials was very encouraging, Tony. Mm -hmm. Having read many of the others in the past <laughs> years, um, it, it, it was nice to see your positive comments and um, where as a town we're seem to be heading where we are and where we're continue to be heading so. hi daryl hi go. hi daryl we're we're going mr roselli is going to give give a brief report okay <laughs> so um first of all uh you know hats off to the financial and administrative teams over in the town um really really nice job um 
the um, the audits have gotten more efficient over the last, I think, three years. Um, this year was really good. All of the material weaknesses and significant deficiencies are officially gone at this point, hopefully never to return. Um, there's a handful of minor things we can go over, but the town has, has really turned the corner. Um, you're getting your reports done, um, closed, out to the DOR, your free cash, everything's being done the way it should be. Um, and, and getting your free cash certified so you can use that in your town meeting, something that you weren't ever really able to do in the past. So, um, so that's all good news for the town of Hatfield. And um, I've been happy to be a part of this progress, seeing the growth. I think we started this process back in 2012 or 13. And uh, it, was, it was five or six really, really difficult years. And it's finally, um, it's, it's finally getting there. But um, the, uh, so, so last year we had a problem with the receivables. And those, those are fixed at this point. I'm looking at the page that says overview in my management letter. And I'm going to quickly go over some of the things that are improved from the last report. Uh, like I said, the property tax receivable reconciliation is now working. Um, Sharon and, and Lori from Melanson are, are working together. That, you know, there were no variances in that. Um, the capital projects deficits were removed. Um, so you either went out and did a ban or you funded them, but they're got, the, there's no more capital projects deficits. <clears throat> and the way, that, the way the Department of Revenue works, this is really important, is if you're receivables are out of whack or your cash is out of whack, they take your free cash and lower it for that variance. Yep. So it gives you less free cash. The same thing with the capital projects deficits. If you have deficits, they lower your free cash. So in the past, your free cash should have been much higher, but I believe it was being reduced artificially by four or $500,000 because of these issues that existed in previous years that did not exist. Uh, in 2021. So if you saw an increase in your free cash, that's one of the reasons why. Um, your ambulance receivables were uh, brought online. They're agreed to the books. That's another thing that was uh, corrected. And, uh, and your cash variances have been resolved. So basically, most of what we had in the financial statements in the prior year or the management letter has been resolved. And this is during COVID, it's during pandemics, it's during a really, really um, uh, challenging time. Um, so um, so hats off, great great job, uh, Town of Hatfield. Um, any questions on those couple of bullets? No, mm -mm. thank you. Okay, uh, the unassigned fund balance is up to 1.7 million. So that's about 15% of your general fund expenditures. So I'll let you in on a secret. When, they, uh, when you get a bond rating done, so you go out and you do a borrowing and you get a bond rating done, they have seven categories in the way they measure you. And one of the categories is your unassigned fund balance as a percentage of your expenses. When you hit 15%, you're in what's called a tier one category. So for that particular metric, Hatfield is now in a tier one category. Uh, on the bond rating scale, which is great. I mean, there's a bunch of other things like demographics and other things that, that partake in your bond rating if you do go out and issue bonds. But for that particular metric, you are at 15%, and, uh, and that's good news. It's the highest you've been in, uh, in, in, in all the years that I've been doing the audit. Um, great. Also included in the 1.7, there's three stabilization accounts that total 460,000. That's part of the 1.7, not in addition to. Any questions on that? No, thank you. Okay. <laughs> so a couple of informational items, uh, and these are just reminders. Um, network security, I know you guys look at it. I know you guys uh, touch it and feel it, but just stay vigilant. Make sure you keep up with your trainings. Make sure you keep up to date on all your technology. Um, changing your passwords, you know, checking your firewalls. Make sure all that's being done. Uh, I can't emphasize that more than ever. There's always, I always see something in the newspaper about um, some sort of uh, malfeasance going on, a break-in. 
uh, some sort of um, hack into the system uh, where they, they freeze your system and you can't use it until you pay them. So, um, so stay vigilant on your network security. Um, just on your cash handling, again, these are just reminders. I'm not saying I saw anything or I'm viewing anything, but just stay, keep on top of reconciling with departments, making sure they're turning cash over mm -hmm. uh, yeah, consistently every week uh, or when they hit certain amounts. Uh, make sure you visit these departments and the cash is being safeguarded properly when it's not in the treasurer's office. So again, these are just reminders for you guys under informational items. Um, there is a new Gatsby pronouncement. I've already discussed that with the town accountant on leases, so we'll take that up with her. It's really not an operational thing. So that's just a reminder for the town accountant. Um, okay. Uh, law, I wanted to talk about long-term obligations, which basically are your uh, OPEB and your pension. Mm -hmm. So your um, pension liability right now sits at 4.4 million. That's not bad. Uh, when I look at other communities, uh, it, it's really not not the worst. Fortunately, your school teachers are all funded by the Mass Teachers Retirement System, so you don't have that burden. Um, but for your regular employees that are in the county system, the liability is about 4.4 million. That should be fully funded by I think 2034 or five. Um, the town should start to think about OPEB. The OPEB is at uh, 10.5. Uh, million liability, which is a little high. So the town, you know, now that you're kind of free of these shackles on your free cash and everything, you may want to start to think about putting putting away some money in OPEB. Uh, obviously, I don't think you'll be able to re really tackle OPEB until the pension is done in, in about 10 or 12 years. So, uh, but those are two liabilities that are kind of hidden liabilities that are out there that I just wanted to make you aware of. Tony? Since my brain's not yeah. working, report, remind me what OPED is, please. I'm sorry. Yeah, I should uh, I should have been better than that. Uh, OPED is your other post-employment benefits. So as people retire, and the biggest one is health insurance, the town is obligated to pay a portion of the retirees' health insurance. Um, now, what happens is that as the person is working for the town, it's accruing a, a certain amount towards retirement. So right now, your actuary has said that your liability right now is 10.5 million. So if everyone was retired right now and you had to pay everyone's health insurance, you would have a liability of $10.5 million. So uh, good business practice says, let's stop putting away for that so the liability doesn't get bigger and bigger because what's happening which is good news for old guys like me, is our life expectancies are, are increasing due to um, you know, uh, advancements in, in medical technology and, and better lifestyles. Uh, those, those, those life expectancies are creeping up, which just means the town's liability is going to get bigger. Um, you're going to have to pay for those health insurance um, benefits a lot longer than, say, 15 or 20 years ago. So... Um, so again, it's just something to think about um, putting a little bit, starting to put a little bit of money away into uh, into OPEP, other post-employment benefits. Uh, any other questions or thoughts on that? I don't know. Okay. Have any. I don't think so. I'm good. And then last but least, there's uh, three or four items. Um, one is, I had said the cash variance was under control. There was a very small variance. It's about $16,000. And um, it's, it's, it's something that you should probably look at. I'm not overly alarmed by it. The, the number is much higher than that in the past. But I did want to just keep it on here just to remind uh, folks, it's not a material weakness or a significant deficiency. There's always some uh, some sort of variance in cash just because there's so many transactions, but it's something just to keep in the back of your um, uh, thoughts as you go through your reconciliations. Uh, on the tax recap, we had um, seen that the indirect costs were not done uh, the way the Department of Revenue um, likes to see them. So we talked to Lori about this, so hopefully that will be fixed, um, you know, on the next tax recap. Uh, thirdly, student activities, those haven't been done in a few years, so we'll be contacting the school 
to look at the student activity accounts um, for um, this past fiscal year. We'll be doing those in the spring. And there is a slight variance on the student activities that are maintained in the bank account versus what's on the books. So we'll try to get to the bottom of that. Can I just and then uh, and then your payroll payroll withholdings. There's a, uh, a few variances in payroll withholdings uh, that need to be addressed. So this is the handful of items. Um, I don't know for you older timers. You know we used to have about a 25 page management letter. Well, we're down we're down to a page, uh, a handful really of <laughs> items that uh, that I call house cleaning. And um, so um, so that's what I got. Any questions? Nice job, everyone. Um, happy to see it hopefully it continues i just had one quick question that's actually probably more for sharing student activities is would that be like the class funds yes, uh, student activities. you see them on your schedules or staffs or in our world so they didn't do a good job of reconciling previous to all of this so we're already started to work on this that's so that when roselli comes the next time okay we'll be ready for so that's this. like the accounts that each class has exactly and it all or, rolls up into one account in the end of the day but sometimes things are getting paid out of it and not getting booked the money didn't get moved at the bank so the bank has more than the town thinks that the bank has because transfers didn't happen so Lori and i have already started that process to get it good get it ready for the next audit so um Go ahead. I, I just wanted to thank Tony again. Mm -hmm. He's um, not only the town's auditor, but has always been a uh, uh, offered guidance with us over, especially uh, through some rough years. And I'd like to, um, you know, go on record publicly mm -hmm. uh, as well as Tony and thank Sharon and the accounting mm -hmm. office. And, Lori and, Delolio and, is yeah, on Lori, with us. Yeah, Lori, our uh, Marlene, our, our entire team here in the building. Everybody contributes to to the success that we have, and. Uh, it's oh Lori's online agents here, and so and thank Lori and it's just very very uh, it's very promising having sat here now I think this is my seventh or eighth year, Ed's been here for a lot of it and many of the finance committee and those uh, certainly on TV and in the audience and Marlene assessors yeah uh, the assessors office but we we we've just seen it you know really <laughs> ramp up and become the positive uh, type of reporting that we want to see so I just want to thank everybody for your efforts and and Tony's right what used to be multiple pages is now four bullets on, a, on not even a complete page on the end uh, of, of just a handful of things none of which are earth-shattering and, and we're already working on resolving them so uh, I'll stop talking now but again thank you everybody for all your your hard work yeah I agree I, I want to thank everybody and and I want to say, now that we're there, we want to stay there. Yeah. We don't want to go back again. So I, I do ben appreciate all the work everybody's put in over the years to get us finally to this point, yep. which is a great place to be right now. Yes, a lot, my, a lot of gratitude to, to the entire team. So, uh, so I, thank, have a, I have a question. Yeah. I'm sorry. I'm going to go back to the cash variance. Yep. Um, is this something that we're going to continue to work on? Because I know. Okay, because because I know that was a bone of contention for many years, and I know you're you're working hard at it. Yeah. I'm just. You only get so much done in a certain amount of time, so you just keep working on the list. So we're, we got it really whittled down. So we got some time to finish up the rest just, of it. Just just to give you an idea, one year we showed up. I think it was 2017 or 18. The cash was out three million dollars when we showed up. Right. Just to give you an idea how small right. it is right now, and. Right. Um, the uh, town accountant at the time had misplaced a, uh, a bond payment or some sort of debt payment. And then there was something from the state that wasn't recorded. So so we came in and we're like, this is off $3 million. You know, we, we, we can't do the audit until you start looking for it. So that just gives you an idea of, uh, you know, it's down to, I think, twelve or $16,000. That's That gives you an idea of where it's come from right. and where it is now. So, yeah, I, um, I think that was about the time we got hauled down to the state office. <laughs> so, yeah, I remember. I so. yeah. Yeah. We drove together, I think, Daryl. <laughs> yes, I do remember that. Oh, I remember. Our friends at DOR, yes. <laughs> yes. Anyway, thank you, Tony. Well, yes, thank, thank you, you everybody. Tony. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you, everybody. Tony. Thank you. Have a great night, guys. Thank you. Thank you, you as well. Thank you, Lori. <laughs> So we're going to um, get back on track here about 15 minutes late after the way we had it scheduled, but we're joined by David Prickett, Eric Meals, um, to talk about our wastewater treatment plant.
um, and the, uh, the project to upgrade that. Indeed. Everybody's got a copy of the, the handout that was circulated earlier mm -hmm. today? Mm -hmm. Okay. Marlene, will this be put up on the website maybe so people would be able to see it? Uh, we will. Okay. Are you asking if it's there now? No, no, no I'm asking oh, okay. if we can yes, get it Yes, we up will, there. absolutely. Okay. okay, I'll try to keep this. I know you have a long agenda. I'll try to keep this to a five or ten minute presentation, followed by as much Q&A as, as, as you'd like. Again, Dave Prickett with DPC Engineering. Uh, you started off with the switch with the good news about the books. Now, write the bad news. So, uh, relative to wastewater. So, um, Hatfield, uh, for those that were part of it about three or four years ago, uh, underwent a wastewater management plan. You took a look at all of your existing wastewater assets, pipes, pump stations, treatment plants, and you came up with a capital plan for the next 20 years. Following that project, um, uh, given the magnitude of the needs, as you could imagine, you have a treatment plant that's 35 years old. Um, most wastewater equipment that's in the wastewater only lasts for about 20 years. Uh, buildings and such have a, a higher longevity, but it's a very mature asset. Um, I think it's fair to say it's at least 10 to 15 years past uh, its life expectancy relative to the function of most major systems. Um, so the focus became shifted from what do we need to fix to how do we find money. So over the past six months, uh, Marlene and Eric uh, and the team have worked hard to try to identify grant opportunities. Obviously, loans are great. Um, but grants that help offset the costs are even more important. So I don't know how much we want to get into uh, relative to the select board of the details of the project. I could just say it's, you know, it, it's essentially um, additional provisions on the front of the treatment plant to protect all of the equipment that's down there. A lot of things get flushed now that didn't get flushed 20 years ago. So there's a lot of strain on equipment. Do you want to jump I, in, Daryl? I, I would. I, I would give the Okay. I, I All right. Townspeople yeah. want to hear. You okay. know. I think that's fine, and we do have the time. Actually. Yeah. Okay. No problem. So, All right. Yeah. But thank you. I because right. no, this is understood. a big project, and it's a it's going to it's a big number. Want townspeople to it's fully a significant. understand yep. understood. what's going on. Okay. So the drivers, just before I get into the details of what needs to be fixed, the drivers are basically old equipment, regulatory requirements, um, and safety. Uh, and I'll get I'll touch on some of the safety elements, but. You have a pretty lean crew down there, uh, so it's very important to keep your operators safe, put them in a position to succeed and continue to be economical with your, uh, with your labor staff. At the front of the plant, the first thing uh, is something we call headworks. As I mentioned, this is infrastructure that would be constructed at the front end of the treatment plant. This would con uh, consist of uh, a screening system that would take all of the objectionable material uh, out of the waste stream, uh, rags, flushable wipes, all the sorts of things that Eric can attest are very unpleasant to try to remove from clogged equipment, pipes, pumping equipment downstream, and they really hamper the system. So that's, that's kind of the overview of the front end of the plant. You also have a, a grit system, all the sand, um, the soil, things like that that come down the pipe. Um, the grit system that you have right now is literally hanging off the side of the building. Um, I'm not sure how it's still kind of staying up there, but it is, it's, it's completely shot. It's a very, everything's pumped into this treatment plant, so there's a lot of hydrogen sulfide. Um, it's, a, it's, a really, it's a really tough environment for uh, concrete and steel, as you can imagine. So those are the two elements uh, at the front end of the plant and the headworks. That's a big part of the upgrade. On the secondary clarifiers, uh, the secondary clarifiers are the rectangular tanks uh, on the back side of the treatment plant that allow the, 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 the biological sludge, the solids to settle out. It essentially allows the solids to be separated from the liquid. Those tanks are in really good shape, um, but everything that's inside them, chains and flights and wheels, metal, sprockets, all those sorts of things, totally shot. Disinfection, and here's where the safety comes in. So right now, Hatfield uses, and you jump in if, uh, if I speak out of line and you want to add something, but disinfection, you currently use um, uh, chlorine gas which you could imagine there's a lot of safety issues associated with chlorine gas. So the plan is to convert that over to basically sodium hypochlorite, um, which is a liquid form. It, it is essentially allows the same type of disinfection, a lot safer for the operators to use. There's probably only a handful of plants up north that still have chlorine gas. Um, Deerfield was one and they're in the process of replacing theirs as well. On solids handling, um, Eric and Ken do a really good job of 
maximizing the lack of a lot of dewatering equipment in the plant right now. So your second biggest expense for wastewater beyond labor and sometimes power is sludge, is all of the solids that you take out and you have to send off site to deal with. So there's provisions in here that are going to allow Eric and Ken to better configure, manage the solids infrastructure and most optimally get that out the door without impacting the liquid side of the system. Plant water system. So we're putting in a new headwork system and you could imagine like a comb going through the wastewater and it's gonna accumulate a lot of debris. It requires a water source to wash that off so it can continuously function and take that material out of there. Um, plant water system would use treated effluent uh, after it goes through the plant instead of potable water to recycle it throughout the plant. But it requires a pumping system, pressure monitoring, booster, et cetera, controls. So that's a very key element of the project. And I'd say probably a bit of a handcuff right, uh, handicap right now relative to other places in the site. Yeah, it, it has not ran the way it's supposed to for all the time I've been here. And it was not running that way five years prior to me. Um, we used to have bladder tanks that held pressure on the system so the pumps weren't running all the time. Uh, the bladder tanks are no longer in use. We run a, one pump all the time. Um, it's very, I mean, it gets the job done, but it's very inefficient. Um, so it's definitely a project that will increase, you know, the actual efficiency of the plant. So uh, electricity wise and it, for us being able to use it, so. Yep. Um, next one on the list is you currently have a well at the treatment plant that was originally intended for potable water. It's contaminated well. Um, there really isn't a, a feasible alternative for eliminating that contamination. Um, it's used for flushing and such, but an extension of the water main uh, from a couple thousand feet up the road down to the plant will not only provide a potable water source, um, but also for safety relative to, you know, eye washing and things like that, and also fire protection. In the event that um, you did have a, a disaster, the lack of, you know, water main down there would certainly not help the situation, but, but having that would help. Um, next thing, as you can imagine, uh, when we do a bunch of work and there's a little figure shown on the bottom of the, the, the uh, schematic here, there'll be a big dirt mess, so everything's gonna get repaved when it's done. Uh, with you know improvements to the fencing, et cetera. Uh, electrical gear, um, all of the electrical systems at the treatment plant are, are, are long old. If you could think of electrical in the context of computers, control equipment, um, 20 years, I mean, 35 years, let alone 20, I mean, it's a lifetime. Uh, you can't get parts, um, things that are there uh, aren't reliable. Um, so new switch gear is proposed that would be integrated with the new generator that the town recently invested in uh, for the treatment plant through other sources. Um, and then there are some, I'll call them um, internal architectural improvements relative to bathrooms, uh, um, modest lab improvements, etc. within the building. Certainly not to make it look pretty, but just allow it to be functional, safe, and allow your operation staff to continue in the future to meet permit. I mean, that's what it all comes down to is making sure that you can hit all your numbers on your permits and keep the, keep the river clean and everything else. Uh, last thing is you have nine remote pump stations. Um, Eric has been chipping away at these um, over the past several years, but we have included provisions in there to help with efficiencies at those pump stations in addition to the generators that you're, yeah. that you're, that you're gonna be getting for those pump stations. but. There are opportunities there to um, Im improve equipment to minimize uh, operational time. Again, focus more on like ragging, electrical savings, those sorts of things. So that's what's included in the project. Um, what's not included in the project is, uh, you know, and I think you deserve some credit, the heart and lungs of the treatment plant are in good shape. So those RBCs, those little domes that are out there, if you've been down to the plant, you've invested in upgrading those over the years. Um, back to when Brian was there, I can remember years ago. Um, so those elements of the project, you know, are, are still in good shape and will continue to be part of the system moving forward. So it's really things on the front, things on the back, things related to safety, um, replacing all that old steel and everything else that's been exposed to wastewater, air and water over the last 35 years.
I'm going to pause there, catch my breath, but that recommended plan is $12 million. So I'd say at this point of the presentation, pending any questions on what's included and what is proposed to be fixed, the shift would then go to a concept relative to how the town would get funding for the project, how you might apportion costs and collect revenue to pay off the, the net loan for the project. So that was a lot. And thank you for your patience. Nice job. Thank you. I, I just want to say, I, I'm in my ninth year as a member of the select board, and I've never been to that plant. You guys are always welcome. So I, so I mean, I would like to come down and see it in Absolutely. its current state. Maybe, I don't know if we want to do a field trip or some, I, I'll go myself, but I'm happy to, you know, have other people go. And, I think it's important to and, see it. Yeah, just I'm kind of embarrassed there. I've never seen it. Yeah, just to put it out there, if any resident has any questions after this whole thing, mm -hmm. they can call me anytime down there and I'll either explain it on the phone and if they don't understand it, they can come down and I'll show them too. I mean, it's their plan. Right. So. That's great. Thank you, Eric. Yeah, yeah I'll, I'll make plans to do Absolutely. that, Eric. I don't know whether you want to do that. A lot of you won't stay very long, so yeah. You want to hold off on bringing food. Let's wait till we do the other things. Yeah. 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 If, if that's a really good presentation of, you know, I, I mean, I certainly understand what we're up against, and that we're, you know, we've we've it, the plant's been good to us. It's lasted some of those components that are, um, you're talking about needing to upgrade or replace our well past their normal life experience. There are a lot of tough conversations with communities like Hatfield and others where, you know, there hasn't been a tremendous amount of growth in Western Mass over the last 20 years. So it's really hard for communities to, you know, deal with these unfunded mandates. Um, so, you know, subject to any other Q&A relative to what the fixes are. And again, I apologize in engineer's perspective. I tried to use non-technical terms, but. We, we also, Unlike other surrounding communities, we don't have a capacity problem, right? So there are other oh, communities you're very, you're very that have there. Yeah. huge capacity problems, and we're lucky that we don't yep. have that. So, I think one of the things that you touched on too, Dave, that was important for um, people in this room and the people on TV to, to hear was because of some of the upgrades and things we have made through the years, recent years, that those um, components are, are still able to be used. In, it, so it, it's not like building a new one and knocking down the old one, you know. We're, we're going to reuse what we can if it makes sense. Um, it, but we're not just discarding all, all the You won't be paying off a mortgage yeah. for something you're no longer living right. in. You'll have use and yeah. finish out those old debt payments. Yeah. So speaking of money, Good 12, 12 million is a big number. Huge. So um, Let's talk about that now. Okay. okay, so after we put together the planning study a few years ago, the focus immediately became on, and for the three select board members here and for previous ones, there's always been a will you know, to advance the infrastructure. It really came down to how could we afford it. Um, you may recall that over the past couple of years, uh, I've also been the bad guy relative to asking you to raise your sewer rates to mm -hmm. position you for um, a grant and particularly through USDA. So you did that both times and thank you. Um, we submitted the USDA funding application on your behalf last fall um, for the $12 million project. And where we're at right now is a bit of a crossroads. So USDA has come back and the way their program works is they give communities a preliminary funding commitment and that preliminary funding commitment identifies how much grant we could likely get what sort of loan terms there would be attached to the net loan. And upon receipt of those two data points, then I'm here this evening to basically ask you, do you want to move forward? And prior to USDA making a formal written commitment to the town, they require that the project funds be appropriated. So project, prior to the formal commitment from USDA, the town would have to contemplate whether it wants to move forward and ask the residents to appropriate the funds for the project. So. On the $12 million project, USDA anticipates that they could commit a 20 to 25% grant. So that would leave you with about $9.5 million at 20% uh, of net loan. Um, they allow for financing up to 40 years, which they require that you take the 40-year note even if you paid it off sooner. 
um, and they're confident that they could get you into the poverty interest rate. And I, I use that word not as a derogatory word, but they have three categories of interest rate, poverty, intermediate, and market. And most of my clients have been in the intermediate range. And the power of the poverty rate is amazing because a 40-year note at potentially 1.25% is pretty unbelievable, especially as those longer-term bond rates start to creep back up. Um, that is a rate which USDA publishes quarterly. Um, it's locked in once you get the letter of commitment from USDA. It's good. It's like... Um, it's like when you're doing your mortgage and you can lock your mortgage rate, you know, two months ahead of closing, you can do that. And here, you're essentially locking it in two to three years ahead of when you're going to close your loan, but you don't have to worry about that. Um, but in a nutshell, when you boil that down, 20% grant, 1.25% interest rate for 40 years, you're looking at an annual, I just call it a mortgage payment because everybody can relate to it. It's just over $300,000 per year. That's how much in concept, you would have to pay back to USDA each year for the next 40 years. Um, when compared to just a conventional 20-year loan at uh, two and seven eighths um, with no grant, it's less than half of the, the net annual cost. And for those that are jumping ahead that have paid their mortgages off or thinking 40 years is a long time, it is. It's just really hard to balance near-term needs and costs per household with, with long-term needs. So. So that's the conceptual financial um, formula for your consideration. And in addition to uh, the elected boards considering moving this forward uh, to the town and to the residents, the next question becomes, how do we pay for it? Who's going to pay? And there's no right answer. There's no wrong answer. There's whatever's right for each community. Um, we've taken a stab at a 50-50 split based on some very preliminary input uh, from stakeholders, kind of on the, 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 pl the planning group, so to speak, informal planning group, and based on a 50-50 split. And what I mean by 50-50 split is, we're going to make the math easy, $300,000 annual payment, $150,000 would be paid by the sewer users, and $150,000 per year would be paid by the general fund. Now. That's not to say that it's even in there, because obviously you have a lot more taxpayers in the town than you do sewer users. But relative to the split, it's total dollars into each half. You can choose to do whatever you want, and I've seen everything under the sun in my years with other communities. But based on the 50-50 split, um, first question becomes, if I'm on septic, I'm obviously a taxpayer in, in Hatfield, but if I'm on septic, and I'm paying 50% of the project costs and my house is assessed at $300,000. How much am I going to pay? It's a little over five bucks more per month on your tax bill. And that equates to about 61 bucks a year. Now, obviously, if you're on sewer, you're also a taxpayer. And, and this is where the, you know, the net dollars increase. But under this formula, again, if you had a $300,000 assessment for a home and you were a sewer customer, and you use the average kind of sewer consumption, and you know you pay by the gallon in Hatfield, um, you'd pay an additional $23 for both taxes and for sewer usage. So under that scenario, it's about $280 more per year. The reason we presented it this way is just so everyone's perfectly clear. So under a 50-50 split, um, it, you know, it really ends up being probably more like a 75-25 or 80-20. It's just how the math works based on how many sewer customers you have. It kind of comes down to how much of the town is sewer. And I, I, I might, <coughs> go ahead. <laughs> I was just going to say, and, and I know we had asked for, for the different um, numbers. Yep. A, and I, I had sent an email late this afternoon. And there was all, I just wanted to ask the question also, which I think was on uh, some paperwork from last week, which, which would be if, if it was funded 100%, from taxation, what what would the amount be? I'm going to be? cheat here. Yeah. Your, uh, your finance people are better prepared than I am tonight. Um, but at 100%, it's about a 3% increase to the tax rate. And if I'm reading this correctly, um, it's about 10 bucks more per month for a... So, ra so rather than a $5 a month for, for the 
taxpayers. Very linear. It's yeah. going to be ten dollars roughly a yep. month for a three hundred thousand dollar assessment. Yep. Okay. I, I you know I just think as, as we have the conversation, of, we need a to lot know of power from the tax base. Obviously, right. the hundred percent, yep. fifty fifty, just yep. to have an idea. That's the range. So. I wouldn't. Um, so USDA. You know, they want our numbers to be up. Remember that percentage of median household income that we talked about, yes. you know, last yep. year and the year before? They want us to be up over one, one and a half. But then they start freaking out a little bit when it starts pushing over two. So what I can say definitively is it would be borderline to put it all on the user fees. In other words, I don't think we could get through that that process with USDA. I think they would be raising the red flag relative to affordability if right. it was all on 100% user fees, 0% taxation. So I think the ballpark that you're playing in, Brian, I think you summarized it is 50, 50, 60, 40, down to zero hundred, you know, right. but I, I don't I don't think you really have room on the other side of that window mm -hmm. to put a right. formula together right. that they're gonna approve. Thank you. How many households are on sewer now? Um, 787, I, I think. Yeah. I don't know how many households, but I think that, it's 787. It's 787, somewhere yeah, in that That would include houses and businesses. I yeah. think you've got oh, about. That's a, connections. That's connections. I think you've got a little over 1,000 equivalent dwelling units. Yeah. So if we boiled every customer into what it is equivalent mm -hmm. to a single family home, I think on sewer you've got about 1,000 single family home equivalents. When you convert all the businesses into how many houses they would equal, et cetera. And ball, ball how many houses do we consider we have in town? I'm just trying to. Yeah. Lydia, do you know how many houses we have in town? Households? Households? Uh, probably around 2,000. Maybe okay. 2,100. So, about half is so. So, is it fair to say half the town uses sewer? That, that seems high. Third. About a third. It's a because he's saying they're equivalents. You've got a, you you've got a lot of pipes, right? You, your right. town father's plan for this, but they're counting businesses. I don't count businesses. Right. I'm just talking right. A third. It's about a third of. Yeah. Okay. It's about a third. Yep. Yep. So I think one thing that's just would be important for me to know in making this decision is when you, we came in a couple of years ago, maybe maybe it wasn't even that long ago. I don't know we talked about this project. We talked about raising sewer rates to meet the one, one whatever it was, the one yep. percent that we needed to get to medium income. But I thought at that time you had comparables to other communities. To we, we would definitely during a water sewer rate study, you know, show those early on as comps. To right. So I'm just wondering, like, with the sewer rates, with the sewer rate increases that we have currently in place. Yep. How does that change the comparables? Um, before a year and a half ago, you were in that lowest quartile in right, terms of yeah. how much you spent per household on, yes. on sewer. Um, <clears throat> I'd say now you're probably between the 40 and 50th percentile statewide. And I would, this is kind of qualitative in yeah. nature, but I, I suspect after the upgrade <clears throat> in that like 50 to 60th percentile. So it's a... Seven and a half percent is annual inflation in wastewater business statewide the last 10 years. I don't want to know what it was last year. Um, it, it's just bad across the board. If general inflation was seven and a half. It, it, wastewater inflation is probably 15 last year. It's driven by a narrow labor pool, chemicals, slut. I mean, it's just pretty captive audience. Did I get you in the ballpark? It doesn't make yeah. Hatfield a an outlier yeah i'm just i'm just thinking you know we're talking about sort of a a, a shift a subsidy essentially to yep. sewer users that's what we're talking about yeah um and so before we consider a subsidy to sewer users i'm trying to figure out compared to other comparable people in the state how much are hatfield sewer users paying versus other comparable right. people in the state because right. if you're paying under particularly if you're under the average you know, does that justify a subsidy to the sewer system, to the sewer users? That's that's really a subjective question, and I don't I don't no, disagree I, with I what you asked. I don't, know, I don't yeah. know the answer. That's all. What I can say is, and this is always a challenge when you ask people that aren't on sewer to consider paying for you know a capital project that's on sewer. I will say that because you have a treatment plant 
and a pipe system that has a lot of capacity in it, you're attractive to commercial or non-residential development because the cost of your infrastructure for development is very low. So I mean, I, I see Hatfield being able to continue, especially in light of the infrastructure you just built on 5 and 10 North. You know, people are connecting to water and sewer for a fraction of the cost than other communities. So from that standpoint, the general fund wins because your net assessment creeps up from having those utilities. It's, it's a leap of faith, but. These are the questions you have to ask because and, ultimately and, the and residents are gonna ask them. And, right. and the, doing these upgrades is going to, it still allows us, as Diana pointed out, to expand capacity. Correct. So we, I mean, not expand. We we can add streets. We can add households. Oh, uh, you have a lot of capacity within your sewer system. Right. I want to make it clear that the proposed project doesn't increase the capacity of the treatment plant. I mean, but you it already doesn't decrease it either. No, no. Yeah. I, it it maintains your permitted capacity, and in in many ways, you know, right now I'd say boots on the ground. You might not have the full capacity in your plant to even accommodate permitted capacity. There's bottlenecks right now. So the proposed project absolutely addresses bottlenecks to allow you to continue to approach your permitted capacity. So but that's the difference between real capacity and permitted. Capacity. Yeah, there's paper and, and there's real. But your pipe network, I mean, you look at Hatfield for the size of the community, I mean, you've got a pretty massive pipe network, right? So for you to consider, you know, connections, extensions, et cetera, over time, infill, Absolutely. I mean, that's a luxury that most of my Western Mass clients don't have. And and going forward, is that one of the things that we as a community, I mean, should think about? Does it, it helps pay for this project? Do we look at areas in town where... Well, I mean, the project on 5 and 10 is a <laughs> perfect example of where sewer, ex that the, the expansion of that sewer line will... And it brings in some bring in but, some economic development and, and but some we business. do we we do have some other areas in town where we could push it's it it's also. a catch 22 if <laughs> if the economics work for people to accept the cost to build the sewers in their neighborhood often through a betterment and i know hatfield has direct experience with that in the past um once you once you increase that denominator for all the finance people your unit costs don't go your, your total costs don't go up a lot for o m each year but if you add 10 20 50 units at the bottom i mean that's that's why when you look outside of New England, utilities don't worry about spending money on capital because they have so much growth that right. it doesn't matter. Here we have to worry about being really frugal. So I'll ask a couple questions that I asked the other day when Diane and I were part of it. And one is, so what happens if we kick the can down the road? Yep, kicking the can, as I've always told you, and you remember this, is always an option. Um, you do not have a regulatory order forcing you to do this yet. You have a, a willful plan that you developed three years ago, which has been uh, echoed and reinforced verbally um, by the state. Um, there's a mutual expectation that things are moving forward. At some point, obviously, they would, they would likely the rubber, you know, hit the road and they would say do it or A, B, and C. Um, the biggest downside that we all have right now is we're facing double-digit construction escalation costs. So uh, as an example, the, the couple of the last two projects I bid, pretty scary moments in Deerfield and Orange, um, big similar projects. You hold your breath. There aren't a lot of qualified contractors that do that type of work. Um, we're all bound by some very challenging vertical construction requirements in Massachusetts for bid laws. Um, and a lot of it's stainless concrete proprietary equipment where I meaning, you know, they're not, se they're not, you know, selling 10 gajillion iPhones. They're selling 5,000 pump units a each year. So they're, they tend to be more expensive. There's less economies of scale and it's, that's our biggest danger. Um, we get 36 months if, and when Hatfield gets to the finish line and the if should the residents choose to endorse the project and you ink the letter with USDA, we've got a 36 month shot clock. So we've baked in um, inflation, but if we have three 2021s, 12 million bucks, I mean, you could do the math in your head, it, it gets pretty scary. Um, right. We wouldn't want to be facing that. 
you know, I don't want, we don't want bad things to happen, but at the same time, we want things to come back down and, and stabilize. That's our biggest risk. And, and, and that leads, you know, to my next question, the $12 million. Is it enough because of all the stuff that's going on that you just, you just talked about? Is there enough, um, I hate the word slush, but, you know, contingency, contingency in there? There's pretty robust contingencies. I've been totally honest that I have not anticipated, we have not anticipated three years of 10 to 15% inflation year over year. I don't think anyone has. Right. Um, with that said, I guess one nice element for the group and for Eric and Ken down at the plant is most of what we're doing are finite pieces at different places in the plant so they can kind of be broken out. So one, and we might have talked about this a little bit the other day, but we've started to plan for more robust alternates. So we'll have a base bid that includes like the headworks and some of the most important elements. And then on top of that, we'll have adders. That way, at least we have a project. With USDA, you spend the loan first no matter what. Everything on the backside is the grant. So you, you don't lose per se, it's just a matter of how much we get done. But right. if the $12 million project turned into $15 million because of things we can't control, we can still get 85% of the work done that we had proposed. And you know, my experience has been that people are living the same conditions that often require us to make those decisions at home, at work, et cetera. Sorry, Diana. No, that's okay. I just, I had one more question to kind of piggyback on. Go ahead. Were you, was no, no, I answered? have another, but you go. Um, so then if you can put it down the road, there's, there's for, for my opinion, from my point of view, there's two reasons to maybe not do that. Can you speak to the, are, are we, would be, would we be in jeopardy of losing the USDA funding or those really attractive interest rates? I mean, I'm assuming. Both. I mean, both. You know, Massachusetts tends to get through USDA. The state itself gets like 17 million bucks a year. Like it, there's not a lot of money in the USDA program and we're doing the math saying we're 12 of 17. The infrastructure bill has people in that program pretty excited about a boost to the system. I don't think it's gonna be grant money like it was when you built the plant for 90 cents on the dollar was, was grant. It does, those days are gone. Mm -hmm. But I think we will be able to capitalize on a little bit of a bubble of projects all getting done and having to compete less. The interest rates, and I, I should have come prepared to think about that, but you know, certainly for every quarter percent in, increase in the interest rate, I gotta imagine that it's gonna be pretty dramatic with the net loan amount. I mean, again, $12 million is important, but the reason we kind of lay things out this way, most people only care about how much more they're gonna pay per, per month, right. per year. You know, what's it gonna do to them? That's so, tricky to predict too, because for every quarter point rise in the interest rate, somebody might decide not to do the project. And like you said, this is a small number of contractors, a small number of suppliers in the world. And if a bunch of people decide, oh, we're gonna kick our project down the road, yep. then does construction inflation keep going up at the same rate? Maybe not, maybe that comes down in inversely to interest rates going up, you know? Right. It, it's hard to predict. It is uh, the gamble. If but you can predict out 36 months, what's actually gonna happen? You, you only have to worry to about what's here. gonna happen in the next three months yeah. in theory, right? So the, the, the three or four questions that the town needs to consider, and I'll just kind of bring it back to you and you can, you can leave or you can think about them. One, do you want to move it forward? You know, do you want to do you want to advance on USDA's preliminary commitment and consider asking the residents to appropriate the funds? That's question number one. Um, question number two is how you want to split the bucket. You know, how do you want to split it between user fees and general fund, if at all? That's a there's no, again there's no wrong answer, other than outside that bucket that we talked about that I can't we can't sell it to USDA because of underwriting. Um, third question then becomes relative to if any of it's on the general fund and you know if you were to choose to go through the debt exclusion process marlene was right on top of this you know yesterday and today saying hey that's a two-part process and that's pretty timely you know relative to the to the article and the town meeting vote and then the um the, the election the ballot. thank you ballot question so um so that's all kind of hanging out here but i'd say we have a pretty good window i know there are competing projects I obviously have selfish interest in the project, but but I'd say you're you're primed for a good opportunity. I, and I was just and I think there's a fourth question or or a fourth item, which is the timing of the next rate increase, right? 
rate so, increase and then the timing of if, if you were to put something on a town meeting is it you know the timing of when you do that annual town meeting or a separate one or whatever well be, be well because part of our conversation previously was as of the end of march right yep. so that 1.25 is through the march 31st right um, is that i don't know that that it's march 30th for certain for what 30th. i know is it's quarterly so their fiscal year starts december 1st so December well, it's quarter. Oh, it's quarterly. Right. I, th I think we just passed their. Quarter I thought they adjustment. were October first. April, uh, October. I thought it was December, but you might be right. Maybe their funding calendar. Well, is I, well, because that that is it. Okay. Th that was yeah. what we talked about as far as yeah. I think quarterly. At least for myself, I yeah. just assumed the end of March was the right. first yeah. quarter. That, right. So that was part of our our thinking about what, maybe we need to get rolling on this for yeah. uh, potentially having a special town meeting if as of April, May, June, this rate could change. I think and I don't think it's going to go down. Right, no. Right. Right. Given the world we live in right now, yeah. right? So, is, is, so do we know exactly when that quarter really is? I find out. I honestly don't. Um, I mean, that could determine how we move forward, um, right, with a... In the mark. It's still the end still of March. It's still the end of March. All right. And so the next. Yeah. So okay. I, I was, before we, I, I just wanted to ask, so in this kick the can down the road scenario, if we did, now we have in the past 10 years done a lot at the plant in oh, replacing yeah. things. And so we have not been totally negligent to 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 the plant's needs which which I think the town can be be proud of but if we do kick the can down the road ultimately my assumption and is that it will ultimately cost us more mm -hmm. to fix the plant to keep it up to some sort of for the future <clears throat> speed i mean you know, I guess in my mind, is it better? We're bundling this whole thing into a $12 million project, and it's probably, in the end, would be cheaper than fixing it piecemeal going forward. Phases? Yes. And will you get a grant if you do that? And will you get a reasonable interest rate if you do that? Well, and the, right. the town hall project is a good example of doing it that way. Exactly. I that didn't even my, want to bring that up, <laughs> but yes. Yeah. Not, right, right, not to bring up a sore subject, but, but in that's... this case, you've also got a couple million dollars worth of grant money. Right. Which, right. if you do it piece by piece, right. are you going to get the couple million dollars worth of grant money? Right. And yeah. So and ultimately, it's the townspeople's decision. I mean. And 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 I just wanted to say, I know the other day at the meeting that we were at with you guys, I was pretty pro. Okay. You know, if the town's going to vote for this anyway, let's have a special town meeting. Let's 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 get going. But thanks to Marlene and and in realizing that, you know, I personally think the only way to go forward with this is a debt exclusion. I I, I don't see see the see us doing this out of regular taxation. And in order to go forward in a debt exclusion, as we know, we need the town meeting and we need a vote right we can't have a special election <laughs> in april when we're already going to have an election in For may this. so Let's... so that pushes this whole thing to town meeting and town election which we then take the chance and right. you know that we're going to have a higher interest rate in which i truly believe by the end of March, the Fed's going to raise the rate and it's probably going to go up. And and we do take a chance that, you know, we could lose some of the 2.4 million on, on that. And and I, I guess that's the risk reward, you know. Well, if we how just sign by the end of March anyway, we're not even really taking a chance because we can't, there's no way to have a special town meeting and an election before the end of March. Is well, I guess, so I would ask the question, if we had a special town meeting in March, and Lydia's here, is there a, is there a time frame before when you then would have to have the ballot vote? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the thir 35 days from the day you give me the question. Give you the question? Right. So if you gave the question today, 
in well, 35 days, so you well, can't have the vote. Tell until me what that means, no, no, give no, the question. I, mean, I don't understand. If we had a special town meeting in March, uh, uh, could we then still wait until our normal election yeah. cycle in May to put, the, if it passed, to put it on the ballot? So there'd be a six week or eight let, week? Let me just thing. rephrase that. A ballot question, the select board has to submit that to the town clerk. Right. At least 35 days. Yes. Prior to when the town election is. Understood. But there is, is there a correlation between a town meeting vote that also requires a ballot box vote? Is there a time frame in, between the two in, 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 in which it has to then be voted on? You know what I'm saying? So if we did the if we did a special in March. No, because you, you've done like a, a week apart at the end your I, town meeting. No, I know, but I'm asking for further than that. If we did a special in March, could the that that triggered the ballot question, could that happen at It'd regular? It'd be a six election? week change, a so, six week right. difference. So let me just so I'm gonna ask well, Dave. My my understanding is so you know so you'd have a plan. We can't sign up with this USDA thing until both things are complete. Right, correct. Oh I see. Mm -hmm. So okay. it, so both it, have to happen. So I understand what you're asking, but in my mind I'm thinking does well, it you matter? You said it differently than I, because depending on what Lydia said, I was then going to say, so Dave, do they both have to pass, or is uh, yeah. one of them, yeah. Yeah, you know, enough to, to get? I think so. the urgency for the March special town meeting is less so with the second. Bless you. The, <laughs> okay, the one, one question. Can we contact USDA, explain our situation, and say, we are moving forward with this to bring it in front of the town to decide? Can you give us a little leeway? until and make sure that we're locked into this or yeah i think the next step ed would be should you choose to endorse moving this forward as a warrant article at a town meeting whatever that be you articulate the draft language for that warrant article we contact usda and say let's get the staff in here to just make sure we're all on the same page relative to the timeline is there any way that we can dry the ink before the signatures and try to avoid, and I'll run the numbers. I mean, if it's a quarter percent, it's not gonna make or break. If, it's, right. if it starts pushing like three quarters or something, it's real money, but on right. a quarter, it's like a, oh darn, but it's not gonna it kill you. It just seems like a lot to try to push through a lot of work for Lydia and her office and everything when we're so close to the annual. Right, well, I think you're okay. And you, you, can, you could get a town special town meeting in before the end of March, but you couldn't get a special election in before the end of March. Right, understood. We know that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Both, understood. Mm -hmm. Right. And that's assuming it would just be silly to then have to have a special election in yeah. right. April right. and then a regular in May. I think you're when back if aligned we... with your. Okay. You know. Yeah. So just going with putting it all on annual right. town meeting and yeah, annual election. I would election. encourage you to vet that with your knowledgeable staff, council, et cetera, relative to those processes, mm -hmm. I, that's not me. Yeah, you know, okay. yeah, we gotcha. Yeah. And, and just so townspeople yeah. understand, the reason that this conversation is even happening and, and sound like it's, it's happening quickly, which it is, is because Dave was just notified recently, about, you know, the process just got rolling. So right. mm -hmm. uh, w nobody was sitting around not doing what we should do as right. elected officials. But you got it was, the soft green. It was yeah. time to make a decision. Right. It, yeah. it, so we just got the info and, and, and bringing it forward as quickly as we can. Yep. So, Joe, you know. do, could you maybe come up to a microphone? Sure. I, can, I'll it. I just think that, I mean, you guys always do. So are you great. speaking as a moderator? Yes. Okay. You guys do such a great job presenting, and I, and I appreciate that. You've yeah. always warned us and prepared us. But I think we're within nine or ten weeks of annual town meeting. In the world we live in right now, everybody is so skeptical of, of governments and leadership, and we're trying to keep everything trusting, and, and you guys have done a great job with that. But I think to pull up a quick town meeting, hopefully it would only be one issue, one thing, but that never seems to fully happen. People are going to be very skeptical, like what we can do a reduced quorum, we still can for annual, but I think people are going to be 
very skeptical about what's going to slip through. People are away, people are on vacation, we're just coming out of COVID, we're trying to learn to not wear masks and trust each other. And I just think how close we are to annual, you're going to put a lot of pressure on them, you're going to have a ballot if you do the, the so debt exclusion. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think this stuff all looks great, but I think just to wait the eight or nine weeks for annual, I think you're going to gain more people's trust to say we want as many of you in that room as we can to understand this is your taxation, this is your future debt, this is your numbers. Yep. Um, and and I it, think it just it just seems like too much to try to yeah too hectic and too it, it, and it is. But I, I I go back to my point, which was we just got the information Absolutely. and we're bringing it forward as fast as possible, right. trying to right. meet an end of March right. quarterly deadline. Right. That that was the reasoning right. for this. If we go with a debt exclusion and we also need the ballot, that kind of changes right. the so whole way fine. forward, right? So right. now I have one question as a private citizen and as, as a private citizen and moderator, within eight weeks of town meeting, I don't, I don't comment on things because I, I don't want to pick sides. But just one question here as you go, if it goes to town meeting, there's only a question and, and you're in banking, is you're just showing here number of years financed. You're showing 40 and 20. We're seeing car dealerships now saying finance your car for seven, eight, nine years instead of four or five years. I think you're going to get people to say, why don't you show us the comparative numbers of you're showing one with a 40 year payback. The last pollution system we had has, has lived for 35 years. Are we going to be paying after 30 years in the future on this still into the 40th year? And, and I think I'm just playing devil's advocate of what I see quickly that somebody would ask a question. One is 20 years and one is 40 years. Why don't you bring the math down to be equal numbers? I, I don't know. And maybe that's a stupid question. No, but, not at all. but from the floor, I used to ask stupid questions nope, too, because we, it's we asked that the other day. I'm, I'm uncomfortable with the 40 year, but Sounds like with USDA, at least to start with, we have to be at a 40 year. Yeah, they're going to make you sign the note for 40 years. For 40 you years. You budget to pay it off and you can, can pay it off right. in three years if you want. And that's right. a great idea. So if you do that, you can show people the math right. on town floor when they ask the question, what if we did it for 20 years? What, what are you talking about money? Right. right. And that's all. So but, I, I, but part of that also was the 1.25, right, percent. So it, yeah. it's like. Well, the Fed's so going to raise like rates. A low interest the rate Fed's going to raise rates, you know. but in the situation we're in, they're not going to bring them. They're going to go in little steps. Right. I don't think they're going to come up with a one or two percent increase. But that's why the forty-year for one point twenty-five is like it's it's such right. a great rate. Right. Why why pay it off? But well, I get you know. I get Joe's point because the point of this, the, the original where we started in this conversation was that this equipment usually lasts twenty years, yep. right. and we're at thirty-five. So then we're going to finance the the next generation of it for 40 right. years. And just being the devil's advocate, you know, you show 305 and 791, but that's using 40 and 20 years. That The, the math isn't playing through. Right. And I think people are going to want to see what if it was 30 years or, or 20 and 20, and, and, and what if we did the USDA one and did it in 20 years, what's the cost? Right. What's the savings? That's all. just playing devil's advocate. Eric brought up I'm a good point the other day. I should have mentioned it earlier is a lot of our clients have just kept that money on the 40-year note because it was such a great rate and they've taken money and paid other things off. Right. You know, like there might have been a, a ban or something that, you know, came due and it was going to have a 4% interest rate or something from 15 years ago. And, you know, the stuff that's on the general fund, you have that flexibility because you can make those decisions. Right. But well, I when, I was younger, when I was younger, I would take the longer so. mortgage, yeah. Yeah. pay it off quicker, yeah, but if hard times came, I could go back to the slower that's payment right. and say, yeah. I got some breathing room. Yeah. Yeah. That's all. But thank you for what you guys have done. Thank you. And then, you know, something else that we, I, and I don't want to get into too long of a discussion about this, but it's, I think it's something that will be important to people as we do present this to them at town meeting. You touched on the health of the river. And, you know, that's not really outlined in here how, how that folds into this project. Right. But that would be something that I would hope you'd be, you know, prepared to speak to. Because I think that's something that would matter to people. You've always done a good job cleaning the water up before you put it in the river. And right. I don't expect that that's going to change in future generations. It just comes down to some of the tools that you have that's what I'm to saying. get to that point. Right. The modernization of yep. the plant to make sure that we're able to continue keeping that yep. river healthy. Right. Just, some, just a, another side piece to that. Yep. Um, so then... 
we need to make a decision tonight if we're doing it and the course of action we're going to take to um, well, try to fund it. I, I would imagine we're... Well, we make the decision if we're going to ask towns yeah, that's they what want I mean. to do it. Yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, well, I can't imagine we wouldn't. Right. No. Do we? Yeah. I mean, yes. And do we want to offer different scenarios? I mean, this is the 50-50. Do, do we offer townspeople? Well, you, you don't have to decide. That. I'm you just going to say, I think we need to know, is the project that. moving forward or not? And then we can, right, before town question. meeting, figure out the yeah. But yeah, financing. but taxpayers or users should have some expectation that, I, you know, I, and, and, you know. Well, you have to. I, I understand that. I'm just, yeah. for tonight, though, if we need to, you know, yeah. just to get the ball rolling. Well, I mean, I think we should that require move forward with putting this before town. Not really, because it's, it's ultimately an article, so, right? right? So it's it's an so, article for discussion. So, yeah. yeah. And maybe be wrong of us not to at least present this right. to the town to decide, especially with the USDA interest in the two point four million dollar grant. I think they they're ultimately going to decide, and I think it'd be wrong if we don't move it forward. So. I, I agree we should move it forward and then after we move it forward we can try to hash out how to present it to the town. Right. Yep. And maybe we could have a, a meeting in the future where we discuss that split and have you mm -hmm. know residents who might want to have you know speak to that be able to come in mm -hmm. and speak to that. Maybe have a meeting solely on that topic. Yeah that would probably have be it televised idea. have it on the Sort of the the financial aspects Meeting, of this. Yeah. Yep. I think that'd be a good idea. Yep. I, I'd I'd be interested to know how people feel. I mean, I'm I'm not a sewer user, probably never will be, but happy to pay. You know, like the numbers you put out here are. But I'm just be curious to yep. know how. Well, and you say that, but sewer's not that far from where you. Are. It's not so that I'm, far from I'm, me. I'm right. Hint, hint. And, 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 no. and, and that's, that's to my point. There are areas in town where sewer is not that far from mm -hmm. other residences. Right. Right. So. Things can be extended. Right. Yes. I mean, I'm not sitting around expecting it to happen anytime soon. No. But. No. But, I mean, we talked about this the other day, the cost of septic systems. Those of us on septic, that gets higher and higher yep. every year. So. Right. Great presentation. Yes. So thank, thank you for Eric that. And Dave. Eric, thank you, Eric, Appreciate it. very much. Thank you. Thank so you guys. We'll, are we going to take a vote on making this an article? Are we, I assume we're going, I, I get a sense from everybody in the room that we're thinking that going with the annual town meeting and the annual election is just the way that makes sense. Is that what everybody's feeling? Yep, knowing that the interest rate could change. Even if you made a, uh, for consideration, a, uh, a gesture of, you know, that the select board, you know, intends to pursue this. I can report back to USDA. There's will amongst the, the, the three select board members. I would finance add the finance. Exactly. Committee. I mean, yeah. I'm not telling you however you want to proceed, but. I think that's fair. I think, I, well, I can't speak for the finance committee or my colleagues, but I, I certainly think it's, it's, a, it's a proposal that we, that it's now it's out there, right? Right. So it's on, everyone's going to know about it. Right. Where they, where so, it falls apart with USDA historically is when they, don't see a unified community. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. So yeah. whatever you do, whether you move forward or not, just before you go to the residents, be on the same page. Yeah. I, Otherwise, I, they'll they'll smell those you know cracks and and be, and be able to see that. So. Yeah. I, I for sure. I, I don't know how we're going to do this, but I for sure support moving this forward so that the town has an opportunity. The town residents have an opportunity to speak to it. And it does, you know, to Joe's point, gives us a little bit more time to put some information yeah. out there and get some input. Yep. So should we make a motion to do that? I don't know what they... Do we need uh, that's to do fine. that? I'll make a motion to um, continue moving forward with the proposal for the wastewater treatment plan. By putting it on... For town meeting. Town, town meeting, meeting and town ballot. Okay. I'll second that. Motion's made and second. Any further discussion? No, I just want to say in town it's it's not untypical to keep bringing stuff up to get it fixed and get these articles knocked down. And then 
when you have to replace the whole thing, people say, why weren't you fixing it? <laughs> I mean, it's a, so it's ultimately the town makes the final decision. So, and here's an opportunity to actually save money because you know, on these projects, like town hall itself, if by waiting we've, it's cost a lot more down the road, so. Mm -hmm. And we don't all, as taxpayers, take advantage, you know, like I'm not on sewer, but I have kids in the school, but there's people who don't have kids in the school, but they're on the sewer department, right? So we all uh, are on the sewer system. So we all contribute to everything. We're all part of the village. Part of the village, uh, And exactly. if, if, build, if more businesses can move in because the sewer exists for them, it helps and offset the tax base too. House so. lots that are sewered, yeah. you know. All right, so a motion's been, did we already vote? No. No, okay, so all those in favor? Aye. 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 Did you so guys want to take a vote? So I would entertain a motion to support the proposed sewer wastewater treatment pl uh, plant upgrade project. I'll make a motion to support bringing the sewer upgrade project to the regular annual town meeting. Okay, do I have a second? A second. Second, uh, discussion. Mm -hmm. Seeing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? And you're going to be contacting USDA to find this out. Is a good first step. We can move the ball let now. them know what okay. our situation okay. is. Yep. More and you come. can let them know our timing. Of, you know, right. okay. Thanks, Dan. Oh, Lydia. Oh, Great. Lydia. 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 Do, you, do you want to take a vote down? Marlene, I'm not sure you need one at this point. Thanks, Joe. Of putting the debt exclusion on the. So I, I have drafted um, town and reviewed with town council. There's an article for uh, a debt exclusion article yeah. for a town meeting warrant and the ballot question. I don't think I have that. I think it's handed it up. Oh, we can. Even, can we? You don't have to vote on that tonight. Have to be to me by April 12th. Yeah. Okay. So okay. Yeah. So yeah. You okay if we wait till next week, Lydia? But we just got handed this tonight. Yeah. So. Just, All right, well, what's what's next week? March 15th. Oh, March 15th, okay. I'm thinking we're close to the end of the month. No, not no, yet. God, My vacation's the end of the month, so. <laughs> <laughs> so we will get that to you well ahead of that day. Excellent, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, my gracious, that was... Where are we? It was interesting. <laughs> and actually, I look forward to... Um, you know, being able to do a little bit more outreach mm -hmm. with the community about that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, are, Daryl, are you taking a break or? I'm standing up. Okay. But uh, I will sit down. Okay. <laughs> Sean and Jerry. Sean and Jerry, would you join us up at the microphone? Yes. So we're moving on now to our next agenda item, which is to review some um, budgets that have been submitted. And first up, up tonight is our friends from the Council on Aging. Hello, Sean. Hello, Jerry. Um, Hello. Hi, Jerry. So uh, we will let you speak to um, what you've put in front of us here tonight. Thank you. Well, first, I'd like to say that the Council on Aging Board is just thrilled with the job that Jerry's done mm -hmm. not only this year, but the prior, the last couple of years, just in leading the project to renovate the, the downstairs uh, Council on Aging space. She did a fantastic job. I think her arts um, experience even came into play, really knowing how to look at that space. Uh, so it's a beautiful space that's really changed our experience, even sitting down there for meetings. Um, and after years of thinking we needed, you know, a new center and all of that, it was just amazing to see something actually turn out that, at least for me, works for now, uh, which is great. So we really appreciate the incredible work that's been done there. And I'd also note the incredible work with the um, newsletter. You know, we now have love a full the newsletter. Color, love it. Excellent newsletter that goes out across town. It gets more people's attention, and and it works because we're also doing more activities. That's something else. Um, you know, both before the pandemic and even through the pandemic, Jerry found ways to continue different activities. Um, and then our new software. I don't know if anyone's been downstairs, but we have check-in sort of software where people sign in, which will allow us to have better data on what programs people are using and all of that. So that's been implemented this year as well um, and and there's more to come you know our the friends group 
Uh, that's one of the most fantastic things. So Jerry, right from when we hired her, actually, at the interview stage, she talked about building a friends group here. And, you know, I was like, okay, a couple of years, let's see, you know, let's build it slowly. Gung-ho, you know, she recruited people who were willing to lead that effort. Uh, they took it over from there. They worked with a couple of board members like myself just to create a website and things like that. Now this independent board leads the friends group and they've raised thousands of dollars mm -hmm. uh, this year for the Council on Aging through their efforts. And it's, you know, a group of, what, eight, ten? Eight, ten people. eight people. I've been to a couple of their meetings. They, they're energetic and they really want to support the future of the Council on Aging. So all of those things, a lot of those has, have just happened within the last you know, 12, 18 months. Uh, so it's, it's just really impressive, everything that's happened. So this, this year what we're asking for is we're asking for a postage and mailing increase of $700. Um, again, we're doing you know, a more advanced newsletter. Uh, you know, we try to get it out to as many people as possible. I think everyone over 60 or over 65, 60 over it. 60 in town over gets it. Over 1,300 people get it over 1,300 people. Um, and so that's just the fix, you know, whatever she put in there is just based off of what it's gonna cost next year. You know, it's not anything new. Um, programming and entertaining, uh, that went from 1,400 to $1,500. Inflation alone could easily speak for that, uh, but also just doing more activities um, would also play a part in that. Software, so software, again, we have this new system that will pay off, you know, in the future because we're going to have better data so we're going to better know where to put our resources when we're talking about a, a new council on aging in the future we'll be able to use that data to inform the decisions we make on the space and different things like that um, so that was an investment but also though it was uh, we had staff spend a lot of time on entering in and they still do at this moment but i think over time it will change with the system because the state requires us to collect a lot of information on our participants. And so this new system will do all of that work and will we'll do a lot of that work in the future. But you know, right now, it's because it's the first year, it's still taking us manually doing it. So over time, this will save staff time, which will be great. Um, office supplies, 900 to 1,200. I mean, again, just the improved space, inflation, that's a really relatively conservative um, cost increase and then kitchen supplies that's a you know uh, five hundred dollar increase i don't know if you want to speak to that so the kitchen supplies mainly is cups um i'm sorry <laughs> just drawing a blank right now um so just all the supplies coffee supplies that we need um napkins plates uh for any events that come inside that we're doing a to-go type of things. Um, we had to do um, containers for some of the to-go programs that we had. So it's just a, uh, everything that we have to do, uh, and if anybody wants extra condiments and you know, saw all that sort of stuff that we have to purchase through the... And a, sig and a significant um, amount of our events and meals and things like that are sponsored through donations, you know, directly to the count, you know, uh, local senior, I don't know, senior living facilities might pay for lunch for a certain event. Uh, the friends, the council friends group might pay, I think they paid for an event yeah. uh, recently, what they pay for? Two events, they paid for our Friday pizza and wings day, and they're also paying for our ice cream social. Yeah. So, you know, we're not just sitting around living on this money. We're actually, you know, knocking on doors while well, we're getting our friends to knock on doors and, and raise money so that we can continue to grow our events. What we do need, our big ask would be additional staffing. Uh, some of that is related to the pandemic and the additional challenges that that's created. Uh, we would be asking for you to consider an 18 to 20 hour um, position. Some of that is because if I don't know, you can speak to it, but so, if Jerry leaves to take folks to the lunch that she does every month yeah, with them. I have to make sure I cover somebody. So basically right now, I'm the director, I'm the program manager, I am the social worker, I'm the outreach worker, and I haven't had the opportunity to really leave the building to go out to reach out to other companies and, uh, you know, to get any resources or programs into the facility. Um, if I leave, Cookie only works uh, three days a week. She's 18 hours a week. So when she's not here, if I have to leave, I am relying on a volunteer 
to staff the center while I'm gone. Yeah. One thing I think that's important to the board is that there's always a paid person who can be there in that space. Mm -hmm. It's relatively limited hours, so it would seem reasonable um, you know, that there would be two people so that one person could be doing outing type things. And there is a huge so social service element to this. You know, One thing that the board asked Jerry a lot about is, well, how are you reaching out to the people in town who don't have family around? You know, pressure, you know we want to see knocking on doors. Like, how do we know that people aren't being isolated? How can we reach out to them? So we want to see a lot more of that, and there's a lot going on already, and just even dealing with um, van rides. Yeah. So we transport people to things like their doctor's appointments, to the grocery mm -hmm. stores. So Jerry's coordinating all of that as well as trying to staff the center, um, make sure everyone's staying safe. And then, there, of course, there's the additional oversight responsibilities in a senior center, uh, given the pandemic, that we, you know, we would always want someone there outside of a volunteer, I think, you know, just to supervise. So during the pandemic, with just uh, myself and Cookie, we reached out to over 700 seniors in town to set up appointments for the vaccines, for both their first and second vaccines. Um, and we had to do that simultaneously when she was there. And basically, we only had one line, so I had to ask if I could use another line here in town. Um, we also reached out to a good 800 um, to find out if everybody was okay, if they needed any help, if they needed anybody to get any food for them, you know, any type of resources like that during the pandemic. We, you know, delivered face masks. Uh, we had different grab-and-go events. Mm. Yeah. Yep. Sorry. In, in the budget you submitted, can you tell me where this additional person is okay well it said that it wasn't supposed to include that on the budget that it was separate that's why i did it in the in the it's letter in the, yeah. so in the it's, letter. it's in the letter it's only in the letter yeah yeah, yeah. thank you yeah. she replied yeah. to the instructions yep. Yep. And we, we'd love to see <laughs> the dollar amount. Oh, it's around the, right the dollar amount was if you do 18 hours per and then fifteen thousand six hundred if it was 20 hours a week but then yeah. you've got to do benefits. So when I said she said 20 hours a week, you know me, you don't have, not that you don't want to have to help for benefits, mm -hmm. but it's a whole other added cost. Yeah. And so you keep it under the 20. And there's even, uh, there's, senior services in a town like this have never been more important because you all know the uh, staffing shortages that human service agencies are experiencing. Well, the sort of protective services for seniors in our community who, you know, are either being abused or who are isolated or whatever is Highland Valley Elder Services. And just like every other elder service, they're struggling to find, you know, the basic level of staff. So a lot of people are far more on their own now. So we really, this is the point where we actually have to really pay attention to the people in our town, you know, make sure that if they're not answering the phone for that vaccine or they're not getting the mask, that someone's able to pop over or call their neighbor and say, hey, do you mind checking on so-and-so? Because right now, if we call Highland Valley or something like that to do it, maybe, you know, maybe it's at It's been best, difficult because you know? people have been calling there and they're waiting sometimes weeks before they get a phone call. Yeah. yeah. So. And Hatfield is an aging community. And yeah. it's an aging community. It yeah. really, it truly is. It's a strong community. I have to say that. Mm -hmm. And not like us. the, yeah, the really seniors good. are very What's good. That? Not over here. We're not. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I am. <laughs> so for a center that's open every day, Monday through Friday, essentially nine to three hours, essentially. Uh, nine to four thirty. Nine to four thirty hours, two people is essentially what we're asking. You know, two full people when you include Jerry cookie who you know over is going to be retiring at some point um and then whoever else then we you know we have our van drivers but yeah. you know i can't count them because they don't come in and do anything for us so well, you know, that's our request I, I mean i that request makes sense to me given the the level of service that you guys are providing how things have um you know stepped up and so I, I totally understand where that request comes from. I'm curious if there's any thought to having the newsletter also go out in digital form. Go into what? Digital form. So, I mean, even a lot of our seniors are using email. Yeah. We do have some that get it digital. Oh, you do? Yeah, okay. but a lot of people, they like to get it in their hands. Because we'll I know we, I get, get two mailed to my house, and we don't have any seniors, but for whatever reason, I get two copies. 
I know I get one because I'm on the select board. And I read it cover to cover. Every, okay. I, I actually look forward to it. It's really great. great. But I wonder if there's a way to mitigate some of those costs by going digital and making sure there's no duplicity. We'll definitely be looking at that. Yeah. You can find a digital I mean, copy. Very small online. budget item, I'm just saying. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> we put it online currently That's every month uh, through our friends group website. So it is able to be found there. But now so right we can here, start sending it. If anybody wants it digital, all they oh. have to do. It's go to my community online. Is that the now. newest version? Yeah, this has been in here all the time. Yeah. Oh, and all the newsletters. Okay. Yeah, but we'll find ways to promote that some more. You said you I do read it cover to cover. I, I, read, <laughs> I read my wife's when she gets it. Oh. <laughs> Hope she's not Ooh. watching. Oh. <laughs> uh, and then my final pitch would be one thing I've noticed about Jerry, both in her interview process and um, watching her work here is she wants to go after money. You know, she wants to be looking at these grants that are available, foundations, donors, and she has the skills to write them. And you know, she's done that before. So if we can allow her to do that, that's also going to bring in additional resources to start preparing us for an increasingly aging population. So can you speak to what the, the, what the friends have been able to raise and what they're gonna use that for? compared to what the town funds? So the Friends group was formed uh, May 23rd. Mm -hmm. And what they had done was they got membership fees to start out with. And then they had a fundraiser in September at the winery. Mm -hmm. So with that, uh, they made over $1,800 at that affair. You know, that was profit after they paid for everything that they had to do. Mm -hmm. So that's come in and they're on their annual appeal right now for memberships and for renewal of memberships. Mm -hmm. And they're in the process of doing, we've got a few different events that they're planning on doing to get more money in. There's gonna be a concert uh, with Dan Kane in July that they're gonna be, we're gonna have out here at the Smith Academy Park. It's gonna be $10. Uh, we're gonna look into seeing if the Smithsonian wants to help with some food, you know, like a little barbecue out there. An example of what they might use the money on, uh, we talked about this at our last meeting, is Jerry would love some tents. So if we're doing you know, something outdoors and the weather's gonna be bad, you know, some tents could be popped up. Mm -hmm. That's a request we could go to them mm -hmm. and say, you know, these tents now are like two grand. You know, we'd love two, three tents. Can you cover something like that or can we start with one? Things like that. Yeah, and also if we have some seniors that are uh, financially struggling, we could do some programming and you know try to help them out too. Yeah, it gives you a lot more flexibility and it is incorporated fully. It was actually quite fun going through the process uh, with the group to figure out how to become incorporated and do all of that. You know, we all did it together, which was great. And I, also if there's special classes that we can get in, if exercise classes, Zumba classes, you know, the instructors, they all charge a fee. Um, a lot of the senior centers will charge about $5 per person but you may not have people that can afford that or whatever. So they could pick that up if they did it for a six week uh, session or eight weeks, whatever. Which is a huge focus of the board. Every time we hear a fee, we get very concerned, you know, even if it's a $3 fee for that person who comes in and feels bad that they can't give the $3 and sits there thinking, you know, they're mooching or something like that. Or they so, don't come at all. Or they don't come at all. So we're constantly talking about that as a board. Well, I, I love that you've set this up. I, I wanted to be involved, but there's ethical reasons why I can't do that, which is a bummer. But, um, but the numbers have increased. Um, like I said, I have them right here. Participation numbers. So in, from July 1st, 2020 to June 30th, 2021, we have 498 uh, unduplicated and 5,715 duplicated. Um, and Visits. Then I, Those are like interactions. Yes. Right. Yeah. And, you know, and this is still during the pandemic. And then I did the statistics, which I was able to get off of my senior center. We had 417 unduplicated and 6,363. And that was just from July to December. Right. Yeah. Great programming. You're doing Thank a great you. job. That's all we got. Any questions? Great. Well, Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for the information. Thank Thanks Thank a bunch. You. Thanks for what you're doing. Bob is on. Okay, so we do. So 
Bob, are you still with us on joining? He is still there. Are we a board of health next? So we were, Bob, we were going to take up your budget request next if you're um, prepared to speak to okay. that. Yeah. Okay. Um, boy, after listening to the uh, sewer discussion and everything else, <laughs> makes mine look like a senior on a fixed budget. <laughs> As far as uh, the budget, basically I tried to keep everything what it was the year before, the, the amounts that were uh, voted for during the, uh, the town election, or the town, town meeting, I should say. The only area where there was one cost that we just couldn't work around or get away from our the cost of our SHARPS program, uh, if you're familiar with that, that's the program where we provide the safe containers for uh, people that are using injectables, diabetics and whatnot, um, and then collect the uh, used syringes, and then we process them, collect them, process them, send them off to be uh, destroyed. Um, previous years, we have had uh, $400 budgeted for that program. Uh, within the past year, the cost of shipping and processing those sharks has gone up just outrageously, where now it's um, uh, costing uh, almost $250 per box to ship off and get processed. Um, the, uh, so from the $400 that we had appropriated over the past several years, uh, from July 1st until December, we already have spent $600. We have another six months. So we're looking at a total of about $1,200 per year, all due to the increased cost of the processing, but also the program has been very successful. So more and more people are bringing their uh, used syringes into the uh, either police department or fire department and then receiving the new uh, containers that are safe. Um, it keeps a lot of syringes out of the dump and preventing a lot of... Uh, Oops. Bob, yeah. You did we, again, you, Bob. Sorry. Oh, I there think you your go. microphone got covered up again or something. Okay, sorry. We, we um, lost you for so, a second there. You know, it's a successful program and we'd like to continue with it, but the costs are definitely dramatically increased. Yeah. Um, so from that $400 that we had uh, budgeted for a couple years now, if I was hoping that we could increase that to $1,400 uh, to cover the increase in cost. It, it um, says 1800 here on the budget sheet, Bob. Yeah, you've got 1800 1800 as your requested uh, amount, I, I, which is fine. Whatever it is, is fine. <laughs> I think we can get by with 1400 total uh, just by uh, being conscientious about how we're packing all of the used containers so in you're the shipping crates. So you're asking for an, we, Bob, are you asking for an increase of 1400 or a total of 1400? Uh, an increase in four, okay. uh, 1400. Right. So that's okay. maybe where that 1800 is. Yeah. It's a modest increase for an important board. service. Yeah, yeah. we're program. all on board. It's yeah. Thanks yeah. for doing it. And you're, you're, you're ag absolutely right. We want to keep all those sharps and needles out yes. of landfills and yep. regular trash. It's so. a it's really small, yep. small increase. Mm -hmm. So. But it looks like that's the only increase that is showing in your budget request. Yes, you know, I, okay. I thought we could uh, keep the salaries at the same level. Um, I did not uh, figure in a 2% COLA. Uh, I spoke with um, Marlene about that. And is that something that you uh, figure in? 
Yeah, we, 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 will, we will look at that once we get through the budget process, and, and, and we generally do that. We, we decide other than, other than our um, contracts, contracts will, you know, other people. And last year, I think it was 2% plus, so, so we'll, do, we'll do that again this year. Just the I, wages I, that are reported in the FY22 column on the Board of Health's budget is less than what was actually uh, given. It was approved. So I talked right, to Bob about this, that earlier today. You're right. So the 2022 he, did not include the increase from he, last year. That They got a 2% yeah, right. increase, and, yep. and that's not in there. Right. So you'll add that. It has, yeah. you you got to add that yeah. to the yep. budget. Okay, good. Yeah, because... Yes, but the only real increase so that in the budget is the, sharps, is the sharps. Yes, yeah, right. Um, At this point, thing. the only yeah, increase point, is the sharps, yeah. and then if there's an across the board cola, that would be factored into. Yep. It. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, Bob. For sure. Get the real number for. But yeah, that's Bob. Our, our health it. agent, we have basically, he has not had any increase in his hourly rate for at least the five years he's been here. You know. He's, he, he's not a contracted uh, not a state when he leaves. Or, or municipal employee, so I guess he's not subject to any built-in increases. But so far, he's been willing to continue with the hourly rate that we have been paying him, which, by the way, is dramatically a lot lower than mm. other towns where he does work. Um, I think we're uh, having him at... 29, almost $30. Uh, he usually gets $50 per hour for consulting with other towns. So uh, it, he's just a remarkable person who saved the town thousands of dollars just because of his knowledge in uh, health law. Uh, he's kept us from having to consult with the uh, town attorney. So, you know, I just want to make sure that. Uh, He's still satisfied with what he's getting here, but by the same token, I did not ask for any increase in his hourly rate. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Bob. Appreciate it. Thank you, Bob. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thanks, Bob. Okay. Next up is town clerk. Do you two want to come up to the uh, microphone? So I have two different, okay, so there's the regular budget submission and then there's an additional submission. Okay. The regular. Mm -hmm. Town clerk salary level funded, town clerk assistant level funded salary, town clerk's expenses, um, which relates to the budget the additional budget submission we are looking and I'll let you speak to this we're looking at, a, at programs for the dog licenses and for keeping track of all the town officials and yeah I that? was in on the demo from the company because um, currently yeah. we're using a really outdated software like it's an access program I think we looked it was 24 years old or something so it's just, it's, you know, it's hard to keep track of everything. Um, this new system would keep, especially for the boards and committees, would, you know, track everybody's, you know, term. It would also put in the ethics test, um, oath of office. It would just combine, you know, right now we have like an Excel spreadsheet and it just would combine everything together and make it easier to use, which that, pro, you know, the boards and commissions is really important that that's accurate. And it's, I feel like our current program is easy to, make a mistake or not see something on it so and also the dogs um, dog licensing program right now we again have an access program that's really old and we can't even turn it over until February so that we have a lot of people that come in want to pay their dog license they can't until February so that causes an issue um, and it just keeps better track of you know we can sort it by you know dog name breed um, we can run reports easier through it we can send out letters reminder letters to get our get the dogs well licensed. we, we do now but it'll it's be much more efficient in one system in one software system so so and i'm sorry you have a cost for yeah, that, yeah. That, that program um each program the um boards and commissions database is 2495 okay. um one time 
Is That's that a one-time one, fee. Oh, I'm sorry, but is that the 495 is off of that though? Yeah, there's a 10% oh, discount. That's a maintenance fee, never mind. 10% discount, yeah. yeah it's fi almost $500 for the Right, report. so, it, it, yeah, and yeah. then the same exact cost for the dog and kennel licensing database. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, it's, to the town clerk, um, I, I know the Council on Aging just talked about the new programs they have and different programs that the treasurer's office has had, and we've never gotten any kind of updated program we're still working on those old databases from like you said 20, 24, 24 years, years ago back, yeah. so the cost of the maintenance which plays into the town clerk's expenses <clears throat> i'd look for a 990 dollars increase in the town clerk's expenses because that's the annual maintenance cost for, for the running for, for the software each no Four hundred ninety-five each. Oh, okay. So a total of nine hundred ninety mm -hmm. added to my expense budget. Oh, I'm looking on the wrong one. How do you find yeah. people to maintain those active databases? Huh? How do you find someone to maintain those active it's databases? It's hard. The one guy that that actually it, did the program for the dogs yeah. when Louise was here. Yeah. Um, it just moved to California, so he's gone. It was terrible 24 years. Ago. I do, yeah, I do have a guy who, and I don't know if he's still around. I haven't talked to him for a year or so, but was really, really good coming in to explain. We had some problems with the access program. He was able to fix those, thank God, because it had to do with census and putting out the uh annual uh street lists and stuff so he was able to help with that because you know i've learned how to run it but to be able right, to program it or to figure out yeah. what the program you know yeah actually the new databases also run off access but they maintain <laughs> they maintain it and they have it set up and they do it i think there's multiple towns and cities across the state that use that and so we wouldn't have to figure out how to do the database it's set up for everything we would need already and they right. set it up specifically for your town it's very um you know specific to us our needs what what we need to be able to do yeah. we, own. Huh? We, own, we own the data right yeah yes we do yeah and the good news is if we go down to elections and registration wages because the um legislature has not extended the early voting for town meeting or town elections i mean um i can take off two thousand one hundred and thirty three dollars off of that budget line okay just to make you feel more comfortable about giving <laughs> us the other stuff <laughs> uh, compare, now the extra were, you were given more money your salary was given more because you had extra elections is that still in your salary? Is that was that a one-time thing, that, or was that it was, built it was, in it was, moving over, forward? It's over a four-year period to kind of cover all that, because the jury's still out on whether we're going to have um, early voting and mail-in ballots for uh, September and November. They only said that they it wouldn't happen for the so, so that was elections. added to your salary, correct? Over four years, even though we don't know if those things are going to still be there, right? Because, uh, and then so speak, speaking so if, about your, I would, I this is what I would say if they don't happen this year, because COVID's kind of over and whatever. If they don't happen this year, FY twenty three, then you revisit the salary of the town clerk. At that point, okay. I wouldn't give it up quite yet. Yeah, well, yeah, I, I mean, think and, and you're right that some of that stuff. You speak to this because I, I'm, I'm probably going to retire in another year, so it's really not fair for me to say, oh, yeah, keep it for another year. But it, to me, that made sense. Yeah, no, it's fair to see what, yeah, yeah what the state yeah. decides to do. And then I, I had something I had read that said that our, our census work is outsourced. How does that work, and who pays? What's the? It, it's covered under the. The, the salary, the, I mean, not the salary, the uh, expense. We, well, we, we, used to, we used to pay for um, the envelopes and the, 
process and the uh, printing of all the census forms and everything like that and when I and the and the postage and when I added up what we were paying plus getting people to work to send everything out to pay them then I added up what they were charging it was actually a couple hundred dollars less at the time I figured it out and I'm like well why aren't we outsourcing if it's so it's just the generation of the not the input of like if I if I say I moved and I report that on my census form or one of my kids moved out um, you you're you'd be one of the people I really like because <laughs> so many people move out and then like, don't you tell me oh but I'm saying so but then that information your office oh right does. we just finished it, so it's just a mailing of everything correct. Okay. yeah yeah no we just the, the Board of Registers actually today yeah. just finished yeah. processing all the census forms that have come in so far they're still coming in. They were due the 10th of January, but they're still coming in. <laughs> they trickle in throughout the year. Yeah. <laughs> and then I'm yeah. curious, Lydia and Elena, if there could be any thought to the office being open more. I mean, there, there's both of you, you're both here at the same time, and then there's days the office is closed. And it's been, I know I've tried to come in at, on days and not been able to do things. I'm sure it happens for residents. So I'm curious if you have two staff people, why it can't be open all the time and you vary your schedules so that it can be like that. Um, there's, there's more to it than just opening to the public. Once you increase your regular hours, then when in particular early voting was tied to your normal business hours. So then the, the legislature sees that as, oh, those are your normal business hours. So now you have to do this, this, and this during your normal business hours. So that's a, you know, a consideration that just increasing the hours that you're open also opens you up to other increases in your, in your budget possible I'm increases in your that. budget. I mean, I guess I, I, I like offices to be open, particularly when there's two staff people. So to have two staff people there at all the same times, and, a lot of and then other times, is, you know, training and getting, you know, we talk all the time, trying to train, hopefully the next town clerk, so that the transition, when I retire is going to be seamless, like, there's going to be no. I, I get I, I understand, but I still don't see what that has to do with well, not I, dividing the time up so that the office can well, be. Well, I would say now I've been here long enough. I yeah. could clearly be there by myself. Right. But when Lydia retires and there's a new person in the office, it's not easy. It takes time to train that person. It's not easy to just have them by themselves in the office without you know, either they're calling, you know, how do I do this? How do I do like the training part? You do need for at least a certain amount of time them to work together and not be separated. I guess and, I would I mean, just, it, I, I, the hours have always been since I've been here, the hours have always been, um, nine to four thirty, Monday, Tuesdays, and Thursdays, or by appointment, just call me. If those hours are not convenient for you, I have people that call and say, I really can't get there. Can you meet me? And I'll meet people at six o'clock at night. I'll meet them at 8.30 in the morning. Just call them and make an appointment. That's all people have to do. So, I, I'm just yeah. saying, I, I, I still believe that if you have two people, we should be able to spread it out so that. And I think people, but sorry. I think people okay. got used to Eileen being there and she was doing some women days. Right. Uh, that was where, yeah. as the person who sits across the hall, they got used yeah. to Wednesdays yeah. being open. I, I, you know, I mean, that's kind of part of why you have additional staff, so that people can have more access. It's just something I think we should think yeah. about. And, but also, if you don't have the additional staff, like Jerry and, and um, Sean. Sean, thank you. I know Sean. <laughs> um, we're saying that, okay, then the town clerk is doing you know dog licenses and then the counter work and all that stuff and not necessarily doing some of the things that's a town yeah clerk and i do. there'd be so, some overlap i mean you're still talking about times when you'd be in the office together it's just something i know i personally run into it as you know it's it's been frustrating and i can only imagine that 
at yeah, this but point. all you got to do is call me. I would meet you at 8.30 in the morning. I understand, I but I, I, I would like to see that be right. something that we think about. Um, so anyway, budget. Yes. Um, so the election and registration wages, I just said, I mean, they increased, but we could bring them down 2133. Um, election and registration expenses, those are increased because we got more elections in, for FY23. And then the cer certification is level funded. I think that the requests make sense. The yeah, like the uh, because software. Yeah, because it's I an mean, election. It's, it's a one-time five thousand yeah. and a nine ninety yeah. per yeah. year. Yeah, this is the number of. Yeah. Oh, I see. I go with an increase in my budget so I can pay it every oh, right. year. We didn't have that seems long money. overdue. Yeah, I'm good. You're good. Yeah. I, I, I'm sorry. You probably said it and I missed it. Just so, just on. Um, the administrative salaries union and non-union, it did it pop up because there's going to be elections this year? Is that? The the it what? went up. The 2022 was 6,500 and 2023 is 16,000. You're talking about the elections? The elections budget. Yeah, department yeah. number. Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. Is yeah. that? Yes. Because there's yeah. more elections. That, yeah, I mean, I just wanted yeah. to clarify. Yeah. yeah. In the okay. fall. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, we can actually I figured it. Five. Yeah, because we'll have a primary <laughs> and a federal. All sorts of good stuff. Year. Yeah. Yeah. How are you here? No, not not on there yet. No, I just. Yeah. I just Thank you. thought about that. Right. Okay. I think all of that makes a lot of sense. Thank you very much. Appreciate Thank it. You. Thank you. Thank you. I could not find. Yes, that's what I think that's what we'll need. By the hot seat here. <laughs> I couldn't find. I was looking through here and I couldn't find your building and zoning enforcement office. I'm looking. I'm looking. I went through it once already. How are you? Good. How are you? Good. I haven't seen you in a while. No, you know, you live right down the road. I know. You finally, you finally, you finally live in the right end of town. Yeah. <laughs> I, I agree. <laughs> One of my oldest friends is my neighbor, Lydia. Yeah, see? Yeah. No, we got, you know, That's very got sweet. A good contingent. Yeah. <laughs> that is a nice little neighborhood down there. Yeah. I'll come visit the cows. <laughs> they always take visitors. All right. <laughs> I, I, ha I have every budget but that one, but yours, for some reason. Thank you. Kyle, the floor is yours. Um, basically, it's level funded with the exception of salaries have never been pegged down quite right for the alternate inspectors, mm -hmm. electrical, plumbing, gas. Um, so... Um, we up, I, Sharon and I reviewed it together, then I showed it to Marlene. You know, we were trying to come up with an accurate number. So um, Sharon was good with me and looked at it several times uh, to try to get it so that we wouldn't run a deficit on the inspections. Yeah, we and did run into a deficit yeah, the previous year fiscal after year. Yeah, year after year we've done it. Yeah. So. Are you going to run into a deficit this year? I don't believe so, no. No. Okay. Um, and, and just remind me the other who who's the electrical plumbing. Uh, Tim Patrick uh, stepped up to the main electrical inspector after Buster Szymanski yep. passed. Um, then we have uh, Craig Wright, who's the alternate electrical inspector, and he's an electrician for uh, Northeast Solar, mm -hmm. I believe, is currently. And um, for plumbing, we have Steve Baranowski and Mark Wendelowski. Right. So, okay. plumbing and gas. And all, all of them really do a really great job. Uh, they can communicate to me all the time, call me up quite quite a lot. Tim Patrick's been awesome. You know, uh, there is nobody like Buster, but Tim, Tim does a good job, so. So basically it was just a salary issue I needed to fix and I think we addressed it. Which you guys have addressed and fixed. Yeah. What we were missing is that they were they do extra 
fees? Is that the best yeah. way to do right, it? Right, right. And that was so when Kyle was there for a certain number of inspections, inspections yes. they get additional fees. So we right. were, when he was plugging in his salary, he was looking at their base salary. And what he was missing was that once or twice was, a year where he pays those additional fees out. Right. So now we took last year's fees and built them in so that right. assuming we pay him the same amount of fees next and year, we'll be in line. So it's not an increase. It's no. just more accurately it's reflected. More accurate. More now, accurate. Now the number makes it will match. I mean, the revenue is taken in, certainly. It's just that it wasn't accounted for in the budget to right. pay yeah. them. Pay it out. Now yeah. we finally figured out why. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Seems pretty straightforward to me. Yeah. I don't okay. have any additional questions. All right, great. Nice to see you guys. <laughs> He's getting out of here while he can. See you, Kyle. <laughs> nice seeing you. <laughs> okay, treasurer collector. Gorley? Yeah, I'm ready. You're ready. So I'm not presenting my whole budget tonight, but I need kind of a verbal. Save the suspense. The well, yeah. I the suspense is coming, right? In the past two years that I've been, you know, kind of taking the leadership. Do we have paperwork this. on this? No. Oh. Do you want some? It's really nothing. No. Um, is that we've we've worked, we've talked about this probably for my whole five years of being here, but seriously in the last two years about moving our payroll program to the future of not pen and paper and making it electronic. And I've always told you I wasn't quite ready because I had to do the whole treasure, the collector side of things, which now we've brought that whole conversion up. Vadar's great, Lori's great. So we're doing well. So now it's the step for the payroll. The good news and the bad news is that for one year, we're going to have to pay for two payroll programs because we can't get out of our contract for the program we're currently running. Like we own that data and it'll be ours, but we can't break it in the middle of a year to be able to say, okay, you know, oh, I'll cut my costs over here. So the overlap is I'm asking for $20,000 of free cash money for a one-time year of FY23 so that I can afford to run both payroll programs. So I went out to bid unofficially, but I had to get three quotes. Um, so I brought in three different payroll programs, kind of knowing which direction I was probably gonna go in because most municipalities use Harpers. You've probably heard of them. Some good and some bad. So I had to do some definite research about them. But I think they're the right choice for us because they're already doing business with many schools, many towns. So they understand the math teachers of the world, that you know, the retirement there, Hampshire County retirement, our insurance, our stipends for the school, because our payroll is pretty unique, especially for a small town, because we do have the um, seven through 12, all of that does come through our office. So on any given week, we pay about 180 employees, but in a given year we pay up, I'd send out 290 two W-2s this year. So there's that influx of another hundred people that are in and out of the system. So one of the things I was really stuck on in the beginning is when do you make the conversion? July or January? And I, I got to give Lori our accountant credit. She was the one who kind of like finally pushed me to which direction I am in that I'd like to make that move for July 1st. So we don't need to pay Harper's any money to do this. I just need to make sure you're all comfortable with that before I sign off saying, yes, we're gonna move forward. Um, the July start date, it scares me a little because then you have two W-2s ideally for an employee. But it gives me July, August, September, October, November to make sure all of that data from Tyler, the current company we use, gets pulled into Harper's correctly. Where in the beginning, I was leaning towards a January 1st, so it was a clean break for the calendar year for your taxes. But then that puts me in next January doing the W-2s for 2022 doing the 1099s, which I helped the accountant with, doing the Affordable, Air, Air, Affordable Care Act paperwork, and doing a payroll conversion. Wait, that's a little much. <laughs> I'm good, but let's think about this in a different set. Yes, we're gonna have some growing pains in July, but we won't be doing all those other features. So Harper's will take on and do our W-2s and do our ACAs, but I've got that six month overlap to make sure that everything's right so that when you get your W-2 in January, Sharon's checked it with my fine tooth comb to make sure it's right. Um, the program will really, it can do a variety of things for us. I think one of the most ones that I hear from employees is that it'll have an employee portal that you can log in. So if Lydia needs a pay record, she doesn't have to come to me because she lost her pay stub. She can go online and print them. The same thing with the W-2s. So from the employee's perspective, that'll be huge. 
from the our perspective, I'm going to work with each department for how they want to set up their payroll. If you take my small little office that has four employees, they have computers in front of them. They'll each log their time in every week or every two weeks in our example, and then I'll approve it before it gets sent to the treasurer. So Lydia would probably do the same thing. She's got election people, she's got Elena, they're going to, but maybe not the people, the voter registration people that are only working one day. They may not have their own login. So she may have to put that one or two people in, but her primary people are gonna log their own time into the system, which they can do on a computer. They can do it on an app on their phone. And then it gets brought up to the supervisor level. So me will go in and look at Patty and Brenda and Joanne's time and approve it before it comes to mine. So right now, every one of our department heads is taking that time and doing an Excel worksheet. Marlene knows, right? Lydia knows. They have to do it, you know, the old fashioned way where it's going to come all to me completely done. It, with this step, we'll be able to encourage everyone to go to direct deposit, which every employee except for seven of them don't have but this service will offer us the solution to that because if you don't if you force your employees into direct deposit you have to offer them another solution and this payroll company offers that it's a, a pay card so you could use that instead of a bank account um so that will put Think of, we won't have to print direct deposit slips every week. We're not going to have the envelopes for all of that every week because every week we've pushed the button and it goes into your portal and your, your direct deposit slip is there. So short term, long term, this is the, how much it is to get one year. I do not envision my estimate for next year is that I currently spend about eleven dollars to $12,000 for Tyler, the program we currently use because the accountant has to pay for their share of Tyler that they don't use anymore. But if they don't pay for it, my part doesn't work. So we split the cost so it's not all out of our office because that's where the cost had always been. So that eleven, twelve thousand $12,000 will now not go to Tyler, it'll go toward Harper. I expect 15 is a high number because I don't know really today how many department heads are going to say, I want my employee to log in, especially when it comes to the school. I'll have a more concrete number once I sit down and say, hey, I don't think teachers need to put their time in every day because they already have a system to track their, Brian knows better than me, to track their absenteeism. So they're not going to need to build their time every single day. Or maybe they are. I don't see that part of it. They don't turn in timesheets currently, but all the paras do and all the off custodians. So those people could report that time on this online system. So it's a one time extra ask for this year and then next year it's going to be very minimal i say fifteen thousand, but then i can factor in oh i can reduce the amount of paper and the amount of envelopes and you know really get a more solid number once i know that we've got the go away ahead to do this so i think it's what we've all been asking me to do we're just finally there but i wanted your commitment to agree with me that this is the direction and the time to do it if we choose to say yes today, I tell them and I start the process. So I will run dual payrolls in June. So I'm running it in Tyler and I'm running it in Harper's so that come July, they're live and I can still do dual even in July, but it, the checks will come from Harper's or the money, they'll do all our reporting. So plus the other savings is data entry from my office's perspective because we're not gonna pay Brenda to sit there to put every single employee's time in, which will help with now, when we, we talked about this years ago about switching over to electronic timekeeping, I think at that time you said it was two and a half days for somebody to duplicate. You you put a sheet in, yep. now somebody has to take that sheet, yep. and they, you're saving so much labor. Yeah, and the potential for errors. Exactly. We had an incident last year, I can tell you, there's two employees who have the same last name and the same first initial, and the wrong one got paid. It's $50, we voided it, we cleared it, it ha but it happened because there's that room for human error. Well, guess what? In the new system, they're not even in the same department, so they won't even show up on the same screen, so that department head's going to catch it before it even comes to my office. So Does I it think also that's... track like um, time off, vacation time? Exactly, so time. you can have it so as Lydia much... could log in at any time and see... You I mean, I'm have... sure she, you keep track Plus, of it. Plus, I mean, anyway, this, but... this would have the supervisor approving the time before it's submitted, right? I mean, exactly. So yeah. as a, an example of my office, my employees would log their time in, it would send me an email saying, all your employees are all set. 
It had also sent me an email that says, all your employees aren't set. You need to remind them to do their time. And then you go in and input it. So our payroll schedule works that we try to have everybody done on Friday so that we can input all day Friday into Monday. Well, now I can say, hey, Monday, you, can, you have more time to finish your employees and then come to us. Depending on the department head, you can have, if you wanted to have your requests for time off also be in there in your vacation time. It certainly will do a good job of tracking our, how much time you have, which our current program does, but I thought that was important to see because I've heard horror stories of other companies not doing a good job of tracking that. So if I want a next Tuesday off and you're my boss, I could send an email and you know, if you don't get to see your boss all the time, that is helpful because it'll even give you a warning that like everybody asks for the day of same day off. So it's pretty intuitive of the different ways you can set it up. So that's why I think it's important to say, hey, how do you want it? How do you want it? And they're really good at working with us so every department can have it the way that they feel is important. So that's my spiel. I say so thank, this, thank you, finally. I thank mean. you. <laughs> I'm happy to finally be here. This is my last time. Finally. And it seems like this is probably the last of your programs, exactly. right? Exactly. This to be is my last. There's, there's been a lot of investment oh. in the it, collecting the side and the... Yeah, and I, I even say that. Lori's not... It's going to change in like three years. Lori's not that here, is. but the current Lori. program we use, Tyler, doesn't upload to Vadar. That was one of my important things, that we have to manually take all of our payroll records and put them into Vadar. Well, this is a seamless... They use Vadar all the time, so it's an upload. So at the end of the week, it'll book the, the clerk stuff. It'll put the town administrators, so it goes to the right budget. So... I mean, because right now we have separate account numbers for Tyler than we do for Vadar, so there's always that room for error. So all of that kind of goes away. So this is the last piece. This is the last piece until Daryl's point, until something else comes up, but to my knowledge. So, so let me just get something straight in my mind. Yeah. Do you want this this year for finance reserve before no. town? Because, because, let me just my thought process okay. you wanted to start in june right yeah. may is may is town meeting yeah. everything gets approved in may but you can't don't don't start spending that money until july and they know that so they're willing to not bill us till july okay they work with right. municipalities that was one of my very first questions i said listen i don't have money to pay you in 22 but i want to get started and they said we do it all the time we okay. don't bill you until july when we're actually producing the payroll all that set up is kind of them Conclude. having blind faith in us that we're going to do it and that's what i said to them listen i'm not meeting for my budget for a couple weeks but i wanted to make sure that we could kind of get moving forward so we don't even have to vote just the yes Sharon. this is the path we're on i mean we have a fair amount of free cash so i think this is a little ask, but I know there are lots of people asking for things, but I think this is the direction we all wanted to kind of go in. Will the school department um, be have direct access to this, Sharon? Yeah. yeah. Okay, because I, I believe near the end of my career on the school oh, I committee, I think we had to buy, the schools had to buy a separate Tyler system at the direction of the then accountant right. to right. tie into the town's Tyler system. Right. And guess what? They never work together. Correct. Yeah. So, so that will go either go away or be morphed into the new system for people. Well, so people. they're already not using, I don't know how they use Tyler versus how I use Tyler because they don't talk to each other. My Tyler and their Tyler have never unfortunately done what we all hoped it would do. Yeah. So I think that Riley, monthly, weekly, maybe she does it every two weeks when she does the payroll, she puts the expenses for the payroll in this one cover sheet she does into Tyler. I think she will still have to do that one step, but now she gives me a packet, you saw a payroll today, she gives me a packet this thick with all the time sheets and all the backup, right. which that will be eliminated for her because she'll be able to say everything kind of uploads to it. And I would imagine in the school setting that if you're working in the special education department, you know, they're going to be involved in improving that. Not that Riley's going to be in charge of all right. the employees. Yeah. You're going to be able to break it down into, okay, John, I can't think of her last name, Halpin is our new food service person. He would be able to do the food service workers so that it'll come in a much neater packet and come to us organized. So it's the next big step, but I think this is this is the time to finally, like we heard how good Roselli is. And he actually, one of the things he talked about 
in his management letter is the fact that our payroll accounts don't jive and they don't balance. Well, that's because we're talking Tyler to Vadar and it's all manual entry. And right. so some of it's a timing, but when Lori and I really sit down and looked at the problem, it's that things aren't getting booked into the right cost centers. So if it's a health insurance bill, it's not getting booked under the health insurance cost. That's, you know, the employee share versus the town share. So we need to correct that and we're going to have to make entries for 22 to make sure we're not reporting it for 22 but if we do this for 23 the whole problem goes away because it'll be built properly with the right account numbers in the system so there's and one more system plus. talks to data yes i talked to Vader directly does it. tyler does it i talked to Vader and i said what do you got what is most of your clients use and the same answer was harper's because they do most municipalities Full disclosure, if you Google Harper's, there's been some stuff about 10 years ago that made me have a couple red flags, but I'm very confident that they have put the right security levels in place that some of the bad stuff that happened to them isn't going to happen anymore, number one. And number two, again, they're doing this for lots of towns, so thankfully they've all tested it for us and we know that they're doing a good job, so we're just kind of following suit with everyone else. Lucky for me, Patty's used it in West Hampton, so she already has a vast amount of knowledge in the system, so I already have someone who's already up on it, so that'll help with the learning curve, but I think it's a good step for us, so I hope you'll support me. <laughs> Does anybody else have any questions? No, sounds like it's a good time to make the move, actually. Yep. All right, well... I will move forward if everyone's okay with that. Thank you. But you'll get to see me again for my whole budget presentation yeah, that's okay. at, a, at a later date. Thank you. You're welcome. Coming attractions. Coming attractions. Coming attractions. My budget Thanks, is always Sharon. so exciting. You're welcome. Who are we meeting with next week, Marlene? Uh, I don't know off the top of my head. I am sorry. That's okay. You'll um, just send us an email and let oh us yeah, know who we're meeting Absolutely. with. Absolutely. must be coming up now that Phil's yeah. once he gets back. Yeah, DPW. Yeah, we should do that. We should do DPW. Yeah, I wanted to. He's back. And so, um, Library, yeah, matter of fact, I did. Okay. Um, oh, thank you. Here, just said we pass them down. So you want me to make the motion yeah. to go in executive yeah. session and yeah. then we can shut yeah. everything down? We... What's that? Yeah, we're going to... I'm going to make a motion to move into executive session to discuss the strategy with respect to collective bargaining or litigation if an open meeting may have a detrimental effect on the bargaining... Thank you. ...or litigating position of the public body, and the chair so declares is allowed under Mass General Law, Chapter 30A, Section 21A, Number 3, and not return to public session. I'll second. Jaworski, aye. Moriarty, aye. Zinal, aye. Okay. Thanks, John. Let's take five minutes. minutes. Can we do that? Absolutely.